Brian McDermott. Brian Douglas McDermott was a 10 year old schoolboy who went missing from Belfast in 1973. Described as a quiet child, Brian was the youngest of three sons and two daughters born to Edward and Joan McDermott. Around 1 p.m. on September 2nd, 1973, Brian left his home on Well Street in Lower Woodstock Road to play with his friends at the park. He was due home for Sunday lunch at 2.30 p.m. But he never arrived. Brian's worried parents immediately called authorities who gathered a search party to look for the missing boy. The surrounding areas were meticulously combed through, derelict buildings were searched and the Tellymore Forest Park was investigated, but no trace of the 10 year old could be found. Then a week later on Saturday, September 8th, during searches of the River Lagan, the water was lowered so that the police could have a closer look. What they found upon draining the water was a parent's worst nightmare a sack containing the dismembered body of parts of Brian McDermott. One arm and two legs were missing, and these limbs have never been recovered, despite investigators' desperate attempts to locate them. The body was also burned, leading authorities to suspect that after the slaying, the perpetrator had attempted to disguise Brian's true identity by burning his flesh. Local parents feared for the safety of their children, terrified that a killer walked among them, while the McDermott family fell to pieces and began to grieve for their lost child and brother. Brian was laid to rest on September 13th, 1973. While thousands of interviews were carried out, tips were thoroughly investigated and a huge manhunt for the culprit was carried out, the police felt like they were running out of leads. They reportedly looked for sectarian links, paedophile rings, and witchcraft theories, but none of them turned up any promising leads. They also briefly considered links to the Kinkora Boys' Home in Belfast. This was due to the idea in 1982 that Brian's case concerned, quote, possible homosexual aspects. The home was the scene of numerous serious sexual abuse allegations, which led to a massive scandal and attempted cover-up in 1980. There were even rumors about state collusion and whisperings that a paedophile ring was operating from inside the home, which had links to intelligence services. However, there has never been any established connection between Brian's case and the boy's home. The authorities also looked into 16-year-old William McDermott, Brian's older brother. They had suspected that perhaps he had taken childish revenge on his younger sibling after Brian had hit him in the back with a stick. The police had had their eye on him for a while, but it wasn't until 1976 that they were able to pull him in for questioning, when his mother reported him for beating her. William did confess during questioning, but quickly recanted this admission of guilt, and ever since, he has maintained his innocence and claimed that the confession was coerced. Then, in 2008, his ex-wife told a court in Worcester that he had admitted to ending Brian's life. This was heard during a hearing over William sending his ex-wife threatening and abusive texts. William has other convictions for violent offenses, but continues to maintain his innocence. Brian's older brother, Eddie, who was 19 at the time of his disappearance, has acted as the family's spokesman over the years. He has publicly stated that the family are estranged from William, having cut ties with him long ago. Eddie, in particular, believes that William is guilty of what happened to Brian in September of 1973, claiming that he grew suspicious when William said that he didn't want a book published about Brian's case when a writer approached the family in 2003. He even went so far as to contact his local MP, asking for him to put a stop to it. According to Eddie, William began to deteriorate after this, growing more aggressive and dangerous. In 1993, the Irish newspaper The Sunday Life received an anonymous letter and drawing of a suspect in connection with the case. The letter claimed the man in the drawing lived close to where Brian went missing and even provided an address. However, nothing else seems to have come of this lead. Brian's case went largely under the radar in the 1970s due to the troubles in Ireland. Even now, information on the case is sparse. In 2003, it was noted that the police still refused to rule out any potential connections to both witchcraft or paedophilia. 
After the unjust slaying of Brian, his parents turned to drink, and the family spent most of their days on the edge of breakdowns. Joan McDermott believed her son, William, was involved, right up until her death in 2004. The case of Brian McDermott continues to go unsolved. Anyone with any information on Brian's case should contact Crime Stoppers at 0800 555 one. Rhonda Johnson and Sharon Shaw. On August 4th, 1971, two best friends, Rhonda Renee Johnson, who preferred to go by her middle name and was 14 years old, and Sharon Lynn Shaw, who was 13, spent the afternoon at the Galveston Bay Beach in Texas. A friend of theirs, Glenda Willis, told the Houston Chronicle in 2015 that the girls planned to go to the Wicks Water Ski School that day, but the wind had made the bayou too rough for water skiing. When she saw them at the beach and was ready to go home, she offered them a lift, but the girls declined. Witnesses last placed the girls walking on Sewell Boulevard in Galveston, but Rene and Sharon never returned home. On January 3rd, 1972, two boys fishing in Clear Lake found a human skull floating in the water. The pair thought at first it was a sports ball, but soon found out that that wasn't the case. Six weeks later, searchers found the rest of the body and that of another in the marshes near the water. In February of 1972, the skull's teeth were compared to the dental records of Sharon Shaw, who'd gone missing six months prior. Sharon's crucifix necklace was found wrapped around the skull. The body was positively identified as that of the 13-year-old girl. The other set of remains found were later identified as Rene's, but the bodies of both girls were too badly decomposed to determine a cause of death. A few months later, in May of 1972, authorities received a tip from a man named Glenn Price, who was a local city councilman. He advised that the police look into a sex offender named Michael Lloyd Self, who worked at a gas station and had been guilty of several peeping Tom incidents. It didn't take long for the police to look into this tip, and they visited Michael at his workplace. They asked him to come down to the station for questioning, and the next day, Michael arrived voluntarily, ready to answer the inquiries that the law enforcement may have for him. When asked if he knew the girls, Michael admitted that he did recognize them, but said he didn't know them. After this, however, things changed. According to Michael's story, Chief Michael Morris held him in confinement for hours, telling him he couldn't leave unless he confessed. He claimed that he was held up against a wall, hit with a nightstick, and taunted by Chief Morris with his pistol. Morris threatened to kill Michael if he didn't confess to the murders. Worn down and terrified, Michael agreed to confess. He was reportedly forced to handwrite his confession and then made to rewrite it several times. Later on, an investigator named Dave Coburn would corroborate Michael's story that he was coerced into writing the confession. Coburn even wanted to be a witness at Michael's trial, but he was never called. Coburn had seen Police Chief Morris treat another suspect in this exact same manner, a year prior to the tragic case of Rene Johnson and Sharon Shaw. The final signed confession produced by Michael contains several discrepancies. He claimed that he dumped the bodies of the girls in El Lago, over 20 miles from the marshlands where the remains were found. He also said that he had strangled both, but neither showed signs of strangulation during the coroner's inquest. Three days later, he provided still more conflicting stories, telling two deputy sheriffs that he'd picked the girls up from a Sizzler steakhouse, driven around an El Largo neighborhood with them, and then gotten food with them at a local Jack in the Box restaurant. After this, he claimed he struck both girls over the head with a glass Coca-Cola bottle before stripping them of their clothing and throwing it onto the highway, despite the fact that both girls were found with their clothing. There were also witnesses who claimed to have seen the girls in Galveston around 9pm on the night they disappeared, while Michael claimed that at that time, the girls were in his car with him. 
Two weeks later, Michael Self was checked out of jail by sheriff's deputies and driven to the locations he mentioned in his written confession. The deputies took photos of him in each location, and these photos were later presented in court during his trial as a third confession, while Michael's lawyer rebutted this, claiming that what they'd done was illegal. Michael's trial began on May 15th, 1973, and finished on September 18th, 1974. He was convicted for the first degree murder of Sharon Shaw, but was not convicted for the slaying of Rene Johnson. He was sentenced to life in prison. Over the years, Michael continuously tried to appeal the court's decision until he had no appeals left. He was refused each and every time. Even after it came to light that Chief Morris and Deputy Tommy Deal had been involved in a string of robberies that had begun in 1972. The pair were arrested, with Morris being sentenced to 55 years and Deal being sentenced to 30. Although for many it seemed reasonable to investigate whether a thorough job had been done in regards to Sharon and Rene's cases, Michael's appeals and attempts at parole were continuously denied. Michael Self died in prison from cancer in 2000. An article from the Houston Chronicle in 2011 noted that Michael's lawyer had stated his belief that his client was wrongly accused and coerced into a false confession. Two investigating officers, one Galveston police officer and a former prosecutor for Harris County, also share this belief. Since the untimely demise of both Rene Johnson and Sharon Shaw, there have been multiple other possible suspects beyond Michael Self. In April of 1890, an unidentified man in Taylor Lake, Texas, walked into his local police department and claimed to have committed the crime. During his confession, he allegedly admitted that he had tied both of them down with an electrical cord. This was something the police knew about, but had never made public so they could distinguish the real killer from the false confessions. The man reportedly suffered from psychosis, and for some reason, despite the details he had given, he was later dismissed as a suspect by police. Then, in 1998, a man named Edward Harold Bell wrote multiple letters to prosecutors in Galveston and Harris County, confessing to the slayings of several young girls, some as young as 12, between 1971 and 1977, in the Galveston, Clear Lake, Dickinson, Houston, and Alvin areas. At the time, Bell was serving a 70-year sentence for the cold-blooded killing of an ex-marine named Larry Dickens in Pasadena, 1978, whom he had shot dead when the man had tried to stop him from publicly masturbating in front of a group of teenage girls. Bell had gone on the run for 14 years, but was eventually located in 1993 in Panama, living with a teenage girl. In August of 2015, Bell admitted to taking the lives of 11 young women. He chillingly named them the 11 that went to heaven. He then went on to claim that he'd been brainwashed and forced to execute the girls by a secret organization. He died, age 82, on April 20th, 2019, and his potential involvement with the deaths of Sharon Shaw and Rene Johnson is still being investigated. With all the unexplored options and coerced confessions, it is unlikely if we'll ever truly know what happened on that tragic day of August 4th, 1971, to the two best friends, Rhonda Johnson and Sharon Shaw. Levi Boone Helm, also known as the Kentucky Cannibal, Levi Boone Helm was born in Lincoln County, Kentucky, on January 28, 1828, to Joseph and Nancy Wilcox Helm. He grew up in what was described as an honest, hardworking, and well-respected family, but Levi was very much the black sheep of the group. As a child, he enjoyed displaying feats of strength and agility, and could often be found baiting older, bigger men into fights, and showing off a party trick where he threw his knife into the ground and picked it up while on horseback at full gallop. The family moved to Missouri at some point during Levi's childhood, but this didn't seem to change things. Levi always seemed to harbor a disdain for authority. On horseback, he once rebuffed a sheriff's attempt to arrest him, walking his horse up the courthouse stairs and into the courtroom while circuit court was in session. 
Here, he began to verbally harass the judge. At the age of 20, in 1848, Levi married 17-year-old Lucinda Browning, with whom he had a daughter. The marriage very quickly began to disintegrate, however, as Levi became known for his heavy drinking, physically abusive behavior, and riding his horse into the house. He frequently beat his wife, to the point where she ultimately petitioned for a divorce. Levi's father paid for the costs, leaving the family bankrupt and with their reputation in tatters. Having single-handedly ruined his family, Levi decided to move on to California in search of gold. In 1850, he asked his cousin, Littlebury Shute, to travel with him. Initially, Littlebury agreed, but later he backed out of the trip. Infuriated by his cousin's refusal to carry out their original plan, Levi stabbed him in the chest, killing him instantly, and then he headed west alone. However, Levi would not get off so lightly this time. He was pursued relentlessly by the brother and friends of Littlebury Shute, who eventually captured him. From here, Levi ended up in an asylum, where he'd landed due to his behavior during captivity. After being admitted to the mental institute, he began speaking less and less, and eventually convinced a guard to take him on a walk through the woods. These walks became routine, which led to Levi gaining the guard's trust, which he used to his advantage, escaping during one of these scheduled excursions. Levi returned to his original plan, to head west to California. On his way there, he murdered several men in various altercations, eventually committing premeditated murder. His horrifying behavior did not go unnoticed, however, and he was forced to continually be on the run as law enforcement and vigilante justice searched for him. At this point, Levi decided to team up with six other men while fleeing. He confided in these men that he had eaten all or part of his victims, saying, quote, Many's the poor devil I've killed at one time or another, and the time has been that I've been obliged to feed on some of them. This appears to be the first report of cannibalism on Levi's part. Naturally, it was not smooth sailing from here. While wandering the trail en route to Fort Hall, Idaho, the men were attacked by Native Americans, forcing them to flee further into the wilderness that they were unfamiliar with. Short on provisions, they decided to kill their horses and consume their meat, using the hide to make snowshoes. But the winter was harsh and unforgiving, and the journey long. Without nature on their side, the number of party members slowly dropped down from seven men to two. It was just Levi Helm and a man known as Burton. When Burton could go no further, Levi left him behind, but then thought better of it and decided to go back to him. He returned just in time to hear Burton pull the trigger on himself. Levi ate one of Burton's legs and parceled the other one up to take with him. His movements after this are hazy at best, but at some point, someone discovered him at a Native American camp and then accompanied him to Salt Lake City, Utah. Despite having a wealth of money on him, Levi reportedly never thanked the man who'd escorted him, not for feeding him, clothing him, or transporting him. Unsurprisingly, Levi got into trouble while spending time at Salt Lake City. Upon becoming a wanted fugitive by the law, he fled to San Francisco, California. While there, he killed a rancher who'd befriended him and taken him in, sheltering him from authorities. After this, Levi went on to Oregon and resumed robbing people to survive, frequently murdering them. In 1862, after drinking heavily, he gunned down an unarmed man named Dutch Fred in a saloon before fleeing. While on the run, he ate another escapee who he had been traveling with. At last, Levi Boone was caught, but the public was not safe for long. He begged his older brother, Old Tex, to help him out. A wealthy individual, Old Tex paid off the witnesses to his brother's crimes so the authorities couldn't successfully convict him. Upon his release, Levi accompanied Old Tex back to Texas. It seemed that Levi Helm's reign of terror would never end as he began reappearing in many of the spots he'd already run from. He was finally apprehended for good after teaming up with crime boss Henry Plummer and his gang where Levi and four other gang members were captured, arrested, and tried in secret. During the trial, Levi kissed the Bible and committed perjury, accusing three-fingered Jack Gallagher, a close friend and fellow gang member, of committing Levi's own crimes. 
Ultimately, the Montana vigilantes hanged Levi, along with the other four captured gang members in Virginia City, Montana, on January 14th, 1864, in front of 6,000 people. Allegedly, when the executioner approached Helm, he exclaimed, quote, every man for his principles, hurrah for Jeff Davis, let her rip, before jumping off the hangman's box before it could be kicked away. He also reportedly told fellow gang member Jack Gallagher to stop making a fuss. There's no use being afraid to die. It seems obvious that Levi Boonhelm had very little regard for human life. His life was, it seemed, unimportant, as was anyone else's who stood in his way. His unhinged and turbulent temper, strong build, and ruthless love for violence made him a man to be feared, his reputation bringing terror into the hearts of those who so much as heard the villain's name. Levi was buried in Boot Cemetery in Virginia City. He's noted as being one of the cruelest men of the Wild West, and has left behind a legacy of horror and savagery. Some estimates of his kill counts put it as likely being around 11. However, it seems likely that his true victim counts could be much, much higher. Alfred Packer. Born January 21st, 1842, Alfred Packer, sometimes referred to as Alfred Packer, was one of three children born to James Packer and Esther Greiner. In the early 1850s, the family moved from Pennsylvania to LaGrange County, Indiana, where James Packer got a job as a cabinet maker. Having a bitter relationship with his parents, Alfred moved out of the family home in his late teens and began working as a shoemaker in Minnesota. He enlisted twice in the Civil War, once in April of 1862, where he stayed for eight months, and once in June of 1863 where he remained until April of 1864. On both counts, he was discharged for his epilepsy, which caused him to have seizures as much as once every two days. Over the next nine years, Alfred Packer worked many varying jobs, from a hunter to a ranch hand, but between his epilepsy disorder and poor attitude, he was unable to pin down long-term employment and a steady income. By many accounts, Alfred was not a kind, honest, or hard-working man. In fact, he was generally disliked and distrusted by those who interacted with him. He was described as argumentative, light-fingered, and generally a difficult person to get along with. This was likely why he struggled so much to find long-term employment. Alfred even reportedly spent time working as a guide, but those who knew him commented that he often got lost, and therefore this job did not suit him well. He later went on to work some mining jobs in Colorado and Utah, but found no prosperity there either. Then, in November of 1873, everything changed when Alfred stumbled upon a group of 20 men who were heading for Beckenridge, Colorado from the Bingham County Mines near Salt Lake City, Utah. Word had quickly spread from Colorado that gold had been found, and so the men were traveling there in hopes of discovering wealth. The group encountered Alfred about 25 miles from where they began their trip. According to one of the group's members, a man named George Tracy, Alfred had asked where they were going and if he could join. Since he was low on supplies and had no money, the men were reluctant to bring him. However, Alfred told them that he was a guide and could lead the way with his vast knowledge of the land, and so they thought that he could be a useful and worthwhile addition to the team. Things did not go as expected, however, when it quickly became obvious that Alfred didn't actually know anything about the area the group was traversing. He was described by the other men as greedy and lazy, and his seizures made him a huge liability, making the journey to Colorado stretch on for longer and longer. They made very little progress towards their goal, and given the late time of year, the winter weather was gradually becoming worse. The horses and wagons began to get bogged down, and provisions eventually ran out, so the men resorted to eating the horses' feed just to survive. The best part of two months passed before the men found any glimmer of hope. On January 21st, 1874, they came across Chief Ure's camp in Colorado. Ure was the Native American chief of the Tabawash Band of the Ute tribe. 
He boasted excellent leadership abilities, to the point that he was noticed by US officials and spent much of his life attempting to put together treaties with settlers and the government. Given his reputation as a man of peace, Alfred's group attempted to approach Chief Ure for help. Looking emaciated and bedraggled, they entered the camp, scaring away some members of the tribe. But, true to his reputation, Chief Ure welcomed the men with open arms, feeding them and offering them shelter. Familiar with the lands and the weather at that time of year, the chief suggested that the men postpone their trip to the gold mines until spring that year. He told them that he'd feed and shelter them as long as they stayed, should they choose to wait out the bitter winter. While many men were happy to wait until conditions improved, just as many were not, worried that by the time the group made it to the mines, there would be nothing left. At the beginning of February, after spending some time recovering and preparing for the gruelling journey ahead, 11 men of the group decided they wanted to move on. Seeing that he could not dissuade them, Chief Ure provided the men with provisions and directions on how to safely traverse the harsh path ahead, directing them along the river, avoiding the mountains. It would take marginally longer this way, but it meant the journey would be far safer. Unsatisfied with the lengthiness of the route suggested by the chief, Alfred presented the idea that the group take a more direct path. He secured the support of five men, who agreed and decided to follow him. Meanwhile, the remaining five men who wished to leave but take the safe road did so. They reportedly met with awful weather conditions and were found half starved by workers with the government cattle camp near Gunnison, Colorado, which is where they stayed until April. On February 9th, Alfred and his five followers left the camp. For a while, they too followed the river, but then cut up a winding trail to the San Juan Mountains. This decision was hastily made when the men began to run out of food. They also did not sport heavy clothing or snowshoes, had run out of matches, and had no flint. They felt that the quicker they headed into the mountains, the quicker they'd come out at their destination. But this was not the case. In fact, the only one who would return from those mountains was Alfred. On April 16th, 1874, Alfred emerged from the woods alone. There was no sign of his party, made up of Shannon Wilson Bell, James Humphrey, Frank Miller, George Noon, and Israel Swan. The 32-year-old man made his way across the frozen lake bed to the Los Pinos Indian Agency near Siwash, Colorado. He had rags wrapped around his feet and stumbled into the building, pleading for food and shelter. The agency men fed him, but Alfred threw up everything that he ate. He noted that his digestion had been altered due to long bouts of near starvation. Over the years, Alfred told several different stories about what exactly went down in the San Juan Mountains. He told the agency staff that he'd been hired by his group of five as a guide, but that he'd become snowblind and had been left behind. He explained that Israel Swan, the oldest member of the group at 65 years old, had given him his rifle for protection, but continued on without him. He claimed to have survived on little more than rosebuds and roots as he tried to get by and find his way back to civilization. The agency men noted that, despite what he said, Alfred Packer did not look like a man who'd been starved for two months. In fact, he looked relatively healthy. However, they did not consider this further and allowed Alfred to stay at the agency for 10 days before he told them he wished to return to Pennsylvania. Before leaving to get supplies for the trip home, he sold Israel Swan's rifle for $10, $224 in today's money, claiming he desperately needed the cash. In the small town of Swatch, Alfred took up a room in Dolan's saloon, owned by a man named Larry Dolan. Larry later claimed that Alfred spent around $100 during his stay, the equivalent of $2,249 today, and that he even offered to lend Larry $300. He also spent $178 in the general store, and witnesses recalled seeing him using different wallets. During his stay in the town, Alfred drank heavily and daily, and often gave different stories about the trip he had just returned from. The townspeople gossiped incessantly about him, his odd antics, and the tales that he'd been telling. Then, new faces arrived in town. 
One of them was a man named Preston Nutter, who'd been one of the men to remain at Chief Yore's camp until the spring. Preston encountered Alfred at the saloon and questioned him about where the rest of his party was. The 32-year-old told his tale, explaining that his feet got wet and as he was drying them by the fire, the other men in the group went off to look for food and never came back. Preston immediately suspected that something was amiss. After all, even if he was a poor guide, he had been the leader and the guide of that group. Why would they leave Alfred behind? He also found it unnecessarily cruel that the men would just go off without him. Preston, like the agency staff, noted that Alfred did not appear like a starved man, and wondered how on earth he'd suddenly come into so much money. He also noted that Alfred had Frank Miller's knife, which was explained away as something Alfred had picked up when Frank had stuck it in a tree and left it there. Something just felt off to Preston, and he wasn't the only one to notice. Back at the Indian Agency, the five men from the other group who'd left just before Alfred's party did showed up. The head of the agency, a man named General Adams, told them about Alfred's extraordinary story. Immediately, the men told Adams not to believe a word of it and explained that Alfred could not be trusted. They convinced Adams to send an officer to bring Alfred in for questioning. And just as the agency staff member arrived in Sawatch to do so, things were heating up between Alfred and Preston, who had brought other men along with him and was ready to confront Alfred about what really happened in the mountains in the last two months. Alfred was reluctant to return to the agency, but did so. Just before they left, Preston told the agency staff member everything he knew and suspected. Upon returning to the agency, the staff member explained to Adams everything that he had been told by Preston. Meanwhile, Alfred greeted the new arrivals at the agency like old, lost long friends. Unconvinced by his words, the group demanded to know where the rest of his party was. Alfred told them the same story he had told the agency staff, and claimed to be surprised and concerned that they hadn't managed to safely make their way to the agency yet. When asked about how he came by his sudden wealth, Alfred explained that he'd been given a cash loan in Sawatch. However, an agency staff member who was dispatched to the town to verify this quickly returned to disprove it, and noted that witnesses had seen Alfred with multiple wallets. Suspicion was starting to grow amongst the agency staff, including General Adams, who remained determined to give Alfred the benefit of the doubt. He convened a council made up of the staff, himself, Alfred, and the five newly arrived miners so they could all get to the bottom of things and put the matter to rest. But they were interrupted by the horrifying scene of Ute tribesmen entering the agency, clutching strips of what they called white man's meat. They found the fleshy strips while hunting on the nearby hill. At the sight of this, Alfred collapsed to the ground and passed out. When he came to again, he began begging for mercy, promising a full confession. After a lengthy silence, he said, quote, This would not be the first time that people had been obliged to eat each other when they were hungry. In Alfred's first official statement about what took place between February 9th and April 16th, 1874, he explained that the men had quickly exhausted their food supplies due to the rough terrain and the amount of energy required to traverse it. While they did manage to survive on vegetation and rabbit meat for a short time, the cold appeared to drive all the animals away, leaving them hungry. A few days later, upon returning from gathering firewood, he found four men from his group standing around the dead body of Israel Swan. He had been killed via a blow to the head. According to Alfred, he simply accepted this and joined them in butchering the body. They split up his cash among them, and Alfred took possession of Israel's rifle. They packed up some body parts for the trip, but again, they found no wildlife as they progressed on their journey. Frank Miller was killed next, again, from a blow to the back of the head. His share of Israel's money was redistributed, and Alfred took his knife. James Humphrey was the third victim, followed closely by a young George Noon. Alfred noted in his statement at this point, both he and the remaining man, Shannon Bell, swore on Almighty God that they would do no harm to each other. They vowed to never speak of the cannibalism and agreed they'd say the other men in the group succumbed to the harsh weather. However, despite their promises to each other and to God, 
things took a vicious turn when the pair camped out one night at a lake. Shannon Bell began screaming that he couldn't take it anymore and that one of them was going to die for food. He lunged at Packer with his rifle, ready to bash in his head, but Alfred deflected his ferocious attempts to do so, hitting Shannon in the head with his hatchet. At this point, he claimed his only fear was starving to death. Alfred ate some of Shannon's body, took his money, and then packed up some of the meat to take with him. He didn't think he'd survive, and just when he was losing all hope, he stumbled across the agency. Here, Alfred reportedly stated that he'd developed a taste for human flesh, and that he tossed some of the remaining scraps with some hesitancy. Immediately, at the close of his tale, the five miners from the other party said they did not believe the story. They claimed that Shannon would lay down his life for another. It was then decided that a search party would be made to look for the bodies. It was composed of the five miners, an agency clerk, and several agency officers, and Alfred Packer was the guide. But after two weeks, no bodies were recovered. The group reached Lake Fork of the Gunnison River when Alfred claimed that he was lost and the area didn't look right. Empty-handed and still without answers, the group turned and headed back. During the return journey, Alfred attempted to murder the agency clerk, a man named Herman Lauter, by using a knife he'd concealed in his clothing. He was, thankfully, unsuccessful and was caught, restrained, and arrested. At this point, General Adams, the man who'd always fought to give Alfred Packer the benefit of the doubt, admitted that he was indeed an extremely dangerous man. From here, Alfred was transferred to Sawatch and jailed outside of town by the sheriff. This was for his own protection, as word had spread throughout the town of his crimes and locals were keen to take justice into their own hands. During his imprisonment, Alfred withdrew his earlier statements and changed his story. He claimed that a blizzard had caused them to get lost and that, as he'd said in his previous statements, wildlife eluded them once they ran out of provisions. From here, the men began roasting and eating their shoes. At this point, they made a pact where if one man died, the others would consume their body so they would not starve. Israel Swan, again, was the first to pass. This time his demise came not from the hands of the others, but from hunger and exposure to the elements. Alfred signed this confession, and although it was not his first, it was the first one that he signed. Several months passed and spring folded into summer, the harsh and bitter cold replaced by milder days and plentiful sunlight. It was this change in weather that finally revealed the location of the bodies of the missing men. In August of 1874, an illustrator for a magazine stumbled upon the gruesome scene. All five bodies were lying at the foot of Slumgullion Pass, two miles southeast of Lake City, Colorado, in a pine-shaded gulch. The group had been within a very easy walking distance of the nearby city, had they chosen to follow the lake rather than ascend the mountains. After sketching the scene, the illustrator contacted the authorities, the five men were believed to have faced extreme violence, with all of them having been bludgeoned to death. Israel Swan was little more than bones, while Frank Miller was missing his head. The remaining bodies had skeletal legs and intact faces, their bodies rotting away. The discovery of the bodies raised many more questions for Alfred Packer to answer, and right away, the agency staff and other miners spotted the inconsistencies in his multiple stories. Firstly, Alfred said the men were killed in different areas, but here they were, all in one place. Secondly, both James Humphrey and George Noon had plenty of flesh left on their bodies that could have easily been eaten before Shannon devolved into a starved lunatic. Thirdly, a shelter had been built nearby that had the men's possessions inside and had clearly been used by Alfred during his time alone in the mountains. A well-trodden path between the shelter and the bodies could be seen. Evidence on the scene suggested that the deaths had occurred before the rations supplies had been depleted, causing authorities to theorize that Alfred had killed the men simply to rob them and then lived in the shelter for months, leaving only to remove flesh from the bodies as and when he needed it. Upon returning to Alfred's temporary jail, they found him missing. To this day, it's still unknown exactly how he escaped, but it seems likely that he either bribed the guard or somebody else bribed the guard for him. 
He was not located until almost a decade later, on March 11th, 1883, when he was approached by a man who was one of the party members who had chosen to stay behind at Chief Ure's camp. Alfred had been living under the alias of John Schwartz and was looking to buy supplies, but the man from the original party contacted the local sheriff, who arrested him. Once more in custody, Alfred signed another confession on March 16th, stating that Shannon Bell had murdered all the men while he was off scouting for food. Upon his return in the late evening, Alfred killed Shannon in self-defense by shooting him in the stomach, then hitting him in the head with a hatchet. He then went on to build the shelter because of the bad weather, and claimed that while he repeatedly tried to make his way back, the weather was too uncooperative. He stayed in this makeshift shelter for two months, feasting on the bodies whenever he needed sustenance. Alfred Packer went through his first trial in April that year, and was found guilty of the premeditated murder of Israel Swan. He was given the death penalty, but due to a technicality, he ultimately escaped this sentencing. Then, in June of 1886, Alfred was tried again. This time, he was convicted of five counts of voluntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Around this time, it was revealed by local hunters that while the winter of 1874 had been harsh, the wildlife had been plentiful, throwing Alfred's argument that game was scarce completely out of the window. In 1901, after serving 18 years in prison, Alfred was granted parole. This came about as the result of a local newspaper, the Denver Post, printing several reports on how he was a decent man who had only done what he did to survive, and that the public had villainized him simply for trying to live through a harsh winter. The stories resonated with locals, who began to petition for his release. Eventually, Governor Charles Thompson relented to the pressure, and while he did parole Alfred, he refused to pardon him. After being released, Alfred went on to work as a ranch hand and a guard at the Denver Post. He died on April 23, 1907, aged 65, in Deer Creek, Jefferson County, Colorado. He was reportedly a charitable man who lived modestly. One neighbor recalled that Alfred had told him once that he'd tried to eat human meat, but it had made him sick while another commented on the eeriness of his piercing black eyes. There seemed to be mixed opinions about Alfred upon his release from prison. In 1980, a judge reportedly tried to get Alfred pardoned posthumously, but this attempt failed. Investigations in the 80s and 90s still do not conclusively agree about what really happened during those two months on the mountains. While a 1994 study showed that Shannon Bell had a bullet wound to the pelvic area, it doesn't definitely prove that one of Alfred's stories was right. After all, Shannon could have been shot upon returning to the camp to find Alfred was the one who'd killed the other party members. Many people are fascinated even today with the case of the Colorado cannibal, and whether Alfred was innocent or guilty is still highly debated in modern times. Regardless, we will likely never know for certain what truly happened between February 9th and April 16th, 1874 on the San Juan Mountains. Ambrose Small Peter Ambrose Joseph Small, who usually went by Ambrose, was born on January 11th, 1866 in Newmarket, Ontario, to innkeeper Daniel Small and his wife Helen, who were both 20 years old at the time. Ambrose was baptised as a Roman Catholic just 10 days after his birth. In 1880, the family moved to Toronto, where Ambrose's father got a job managing the Grand Hotel. Four years later, Ambrose began tending the bar in the Grand Opera House next door, aged 18, and by 1889, he had moved on to the Toronto Opera House, where he began to learn the business and work his way up the ranks, quickly getting himself promoted to manager. All the while, Ambrose was also involved in an illegal bookmaking operation, taking bets on horse races. At some point during this time, his mother Helen passed away, and his father married a woman named Josephine Corman. Soon, Ambrose, a determined and ambitious businessman, had gathered enough money to be able to buy the mortgage on the Grand Opera House. From here, he flourished, becoming not only unbelievably wealthy, but also taking his place at the forefront of Canada's theatre scene. 
By the time he went missing in 1919, he owned theatres in seven Canadian cities, including Toronto, London, and Peterborough, and he controlled the bookings for a further 62 theatres. In 1902, Ambrose married Teresa Corman. Teresa was the little sister of his stepmother, and was a Toronto socialite who was well-educated, spoke multiple languages, and was a brutal businesswoman in her own right. The pair bonded over accumulating excessive wealth, but had little else in common. Ambrose was described as a gambler and a womanizer, while Teresa had strong interests in art and doing charity work. The couple had no children. On December 1st, 1919, Ambrose was well aware that the popularity of theatres was declining as motion pictures began to take their place. Knowing this, he made a deal with Trans-Canada Theatres Limited of Montreal to sell his chain of theatres to the tune of $1.7 million. In today's money, Ambrose earned around $25 million from this sale. The following day, Ambrose met with his lawyer, F.W.M. Flock, in his office in the Grand Opera House. Flock left around 5.30pm and was reportedly the last person to see Ambrose live and well. That night, Ambrose went missing from his office. No one had seen him leave, and no one had seen him outside the building in the Adelaide and Yonge Street area. The problem was that Ambrose had a habit of leaving without notice and going traveling for some time. So when he initially wasn't heard from, those who knew him just assumed he was up to his old tricks, gallivanting around in another town and engaging in affairs. When Ambrose didn't come home on December 2nd, 1919, his wife, Teresa, called his friends who hadn't seen him. One warned her off making a big deal of it, so she decided to wait it out for a few weeks. Then, on December 16th, the manager of the Grand Opera House contacted the local authorities, and an extensive investigation was launched into the disappearance of Ambrose Small. It's unknown if the manager called on his own behalf or on Teresa's. Ambrose took no money with him when he disappeared. His bank account, bursting at the seams, was still full of his riches. No ransom note came. There was no evidence of a scuffle or kidnapping in his office. It seemed that the 53-year-old had simply vanished into thin air. Police analyzed the plots and themes of plays showing at his theaters, but found no leads from this. He had not left any cryptic clues behind. Teresa believed that Ambrose had succumbed to another woman, but nonetheless, she offered a $500 reward for information about her husband's whereabouts, later increasing this reward to 50,000. In his office, police found a secret room, which Ambrose used for settling gambling debts and for private liaisons with actresses and performers employed at his theater. However, a search of this room proved fruitless and the investigation returned to square one. There were, however, several witness sightings, although it's not known if they were deemed credible. The owner of the hotel next to the Grand Opera House recalled Ambrose popping in that evening, staying until about 7pm, while a newsstand operator claimed to have gotten into an altercation with the 53-year-old. But this particular account was dismissed by authorities at the time, who believed the man was trying to gain fame from the case. Meanwhile, the Toronto Daily Star launched the story letting the public know what had happened in an article published on January 3rd, 1920. The press was in a frenzy, and the locals were obsessed with the story. Ambrose Small, theatre magnate and self-made millionaire, was caught up in his own real-life whodunit. After years of producing opera house melodrama on stage, it was seen as the ultimate form of entertainment. Coincidentally, around the time that Ambrose went missing, his former secretary, a man named John Jack Doughty, also disappeared. Jack had worked for Ambrose for about 18 years before being transferred to Montreal. He was last seen on December 2nd as well, removing bonds worth $100,000 from a safety deposit box at the bank. Eventually, Jack was traced down in America and was extradited back to Canada. He explained that his plan was not to cash in the bonds, but to hold them ransom until Ambrose agreed to pay him some of the money from his recent sale, and to make up for all the hard work that Jack had carried out for him. Jack believed that he'd been underpaid and underappreciated during his career as the secretary of a multi-millionaire. Upon hearing of Ambrose's disappearance, he opted to flee the country, fearing that he would be blamed for his former boss going missing. Ultimately, Jack could not be charged with the murder of Ambrose, as there was no evidence that he was even dead, or that Jack was involved in any way. 
His sister also gave him an alibi for the night that the theatre magnate went missing. He was, however, charged and convicted for stealing the bonds, and sentenced to six years in Portsmouth Penitentiary, where he served four. Jack died in 1949. A potential break in the case came in 1921, when several newspapers reported the story of a man in Iowa who resembled the missing 50-year-old Ambrose Small. A private investigator named John Brothy described the man suspected of being Ambrose as, quote, a half-crazed cripple, but this didn't stop John from thinking that this really was the disappearing businessman. Reportedly, the unidentified man had been dropped off in Iowa by an unknown motorist who said he had accidentally struck the man with his car. He had dropped him off, hoping he would receive good medical treatment. The unidentified man, thought to be Ambrose, had suffered brutally. He had a gunshot wound to the neck, a serious concussion, and both of his legs had been severed from the knee down. For three weeks, the man remained silent, not speaking to anyone. Then, finally, he said, quote, I am Jack Doughty. I came here from Omaha. That's all I remember. At this time, Jack Doughty had already been caught, arrested, and imprisoned, so the unidentified man was certainly not Jack Doughty. The private investigator then claimed he had shown the man a photo of Ambrose, and the man pointed at it and said, yes, that is me. The two bore the same facial characteristics, but the unidentified man weighed much more than Ambrose did at the time of his disappearance. Regardless of this, the man was taken into custody by the private investigator and his colleagues, but the local police stated that they were unaware of the situation and were never contacted regarding it. There is little more information about this part of the investigation, and it is to this day unknown exactly what became of the unidentified man, or if he was ever ruled out. After this point, the investigation slowed considerably, and was eventually closed. However, the disappearance of Ambrose Small was reopened in 1936 and spearheaded by a new investigator, Edward Hammond, who consulted with the original team assigned to the case, obtained copies of reports, and re-interviewed witnesses. Edward Hammond then concluded that Ambrose was murdered in a plot devised by his wife, and implied that the man originally investigating the case Austin Mitchell either ignored or repressed evidence that led to Teresa Small being seen as a suspect. However, Edward Hammond was not the only one to suspect Teresa's involvement. Gertrude and Florence Small, sisters of Ambrose, also believed that their brother's wife was, in some way, shape, or form, connected to the case. Since their father remarried, the two sisters had been financially dependent on Ambrose, and they ended up ensnared in a lengthy court dispute with Teresa over their brother's wealth. They also hired a private investigator to look into their sister-in-law and discover any connection between her and the disappearance of Ambrose, but nothing was ever found. Teresa passed away on October 14th, 1935, bequeathing the majority of her holdings, worth tens of millions of dollars today, to the Roman Catholic Church. According to the Portsmouth Evening News, a year later in 1936, Florence Small presented a letter of confession from someone called Ruta, which states as follows. Poor Ambrose was killed on December 2nd, 1919, and I know that part of his body, the trunk, was buried in the Rosedale Ravine dump, and other parts of the body were burned in the Grand Opera House furnace. You will be surprised, my dear Florence and Gertrude, to learn that I am more responsible for your brother's death. God forgive me. Ruta. It's unknown if police investigated this lead or cleared it as some sort of sick hoax. It's also uncertain where the letter came from, exactly. The letter was published worldwide, including in the New York Daily News and the Portsmouth Evening News in the United Kingdom. Since the mysterious disappearance in December of 1919, the case of Ambrose Small has continually attracted attention. While the case may be cold, and Ambrose was declared dead in 1924, there have been sightings of him all across the globe. A caretaker claimed to have seen four men burying something heavy in a dump in Rosedale Ravine on the night of December 2nd. An engineer swore he saw Ambrose being held in a speeding car heading north that very night. A magician believed he had seen Ambrose playing roulette in Mexico on April 8th, 1920. Rumour has it he was kidnapped by New York gangsters, while others reported seeing him in Boston and Minneapolis. 
From what's available online, none of these sightings were ever verified. During a trip to New York, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the famous writer behind the Sherlock Holmes novels, was told about the case of Ambrose Small. He showed interest in it, and consequently, headlines across the country declared he was going to take the case. Ultimately, however, he chose not to. In recent years, the case of Ambrose Small has not been forgotten. It's often speculated upon, with people wondering why he would want to kill himself, if that's what he did, or why he would leave everyone behind, especially his sisters whom, if he had chosen to leave of his own free will, he did not make any provisions for. For many, it seems unlikely that a well-known millionaire would be able to simply vanish or go unidentified if he had a case of amnesia. A number of online sleuths speculate that he either fell victim to a jealous husband, whose wife he had been having an affair with, or he ended up passing away during a kidnapping gone wrong. In 1965, police inspected a possible gravesite, and in 1970, rumours swirled that his ghost was haunting the Grand Opera House. In 1974, the Toronto Sun printed a six-page story on the curious vanishing of Ambrose. His disappearance was so strange that it was dubbed the crime of the century. It's been over 100 years since Ambrose Small went missing, and to this day, nobody has any answers as to what happened on the evening of December 2nd, 1919. Dorothy Arnold. Dorothy Harriet Camille Arnold was born on July 1st, 1885 in New York City. A socialite and heiress, Dorothy's family was wealthy and held a considerable amount of social status. Her father, Francis Rose Arnold, was a fine goods importer, dealing specifically with perfumes, and he had four children with Dorothy's mother, Mary Martha Parks Arnold. Dorothy was the second oldest child. She had an older brother named John and two younger siblings, Marjorie and Dan. As a child, Dorothy attended the Velton School for Girls in NYC, and she went on to graduate from college in 1905, where she studied literature and language. Upon graduating, she continued to live in the family home, trying to launch her writing career. Writing was, by all accounts, Dorothy's biggest passion in life, and she yearned to see her own work in print. However, her family and friends did not support this artistic lifestyle. They often sneered and poked fun at her, especially when she received rejection letters from publishers and magazines. In the spring of 1910, a short story she had submitted to McClure's magazine was rejected. Within months, another story had been refused from the same magazine company. Heartbroken and embarrassed, Dorothy continued to wear a fake smile and carry on with her life as normal, but some people suspect that this continued rejection and the fact that no one in her life supported her ambitions is what led to her eventual disappearance that year. On December 12, 1910, Dorothy left her family home at around 11 a.m., telling her mother she was going shopping for a dress for Marjorie's upcoming debutante party. Her mother, Mary, offered to accompany her daughter, something which was seen as unusual, as reportedly Mary was often unwell. But Dorothy politely declined and told her mother that if she found a dress, she would call her. Upon leaving the house, Dorothy had about $25 to $30 worth of cash on her, which is the modern day equivalent of between $700 and $800. From here, we know that Dorothy walked from her home on 79th Street to the Park and Tilford store at the corner of 5th Avenue and 27th Street. She charged half a box of chocolates to her father's account and then walked to Brentano's, the bookstore, where she bought a copy of a humorous book called Engaged Girl Sketches by Emily Blake. According to the employees of the bookstore, there was nothing unusual about Dorothy. While not in high spirits, she was polite and pleasant and nothing seemed amiss. When she left the bookstore, Dorothy ran into an old friend of hers, a woman named Gladys King. The pair chatted for a bit, discussing the upcoming debutante party, and, much like the bookstore's staff, Gladys found her friend was talkative and seemed in a stable mood. They then parted ways, as Gladys was meeting her mother for lunch. Dorothy mentioned that she would walk home through Central Park. She was last seen at 27th Street just before 2pm, waving goodbye. Dorothy's family grew suspicious when she did not return home for dinner. 
This was highly uncharacteristic of the 25 year old, as she would never miss it without at least informing someone in the family first. Not wishing to draw too much attention to themselves, the family called around Dorothy's friends, asking if anyone had seen her. They told her they had not. Just after midnight, a friend rang the family back, asking if she had been found. Mary, who answered the call, told her that yes, Dorothy was back home. When the friend asked to speak to her, however, Mary refused, saying that her daughter had gone off to bed with a headache. Unfortunately, valuable time in Dorothy's case was lost when the family did not immediately report her disappearance. Fearing the unwanted media attention and social embarrassment, the Arnolds refused to contact authorities. Instead, the following day, Dorothy's older brother John called the family lawyer and friend John S. Keith, who came to the house to search for clues. In Dorothy's room, he found personal letters with foreign postmarks, although the nature of these letters is unknown. He also found two pamphlets for transatlantic steamliners and burned papers in the fireplace, suspected to be Dorothy's rejected manuscripts. Nothing else of note was found in her room. All her clothes and belongings were in place, except for what she had on her the day she disappeared. In the following weeks, John Keith visited jails, hospitals, and morgues in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, but found no sign of Dorothy Arnold. He later told the press that two months after she'd gone missing, he had received a tip from a lawyer that Dorothy was in a local sanatorium in Pittsburgh, and he'd sent two agency men to look for her, but the woman they found was not Dorothy. Since his searches turned up nothing new, John Keith suggested that the family contact Pinkerton Detective Agency and hire them to investigate the case. The family did so, and the agency searched hospitals and places Dorothy was known to frequent. They interviewed old classmates and her friends, but no one had seen her or knew anything relating to her disappearance. Given the transatlantic pamphlets found in her room, the agency theorized that Dorothy had perhaps gone off to Europe to elope with a man. However, when they looked for her name in marriage records, they could not locate her. Agents even traveled out to Europe to check ships that had come in from New York, and although several similar looking women were found, Dorothy herself was not. At a loose end, the agency, along with John Keith, suggested that the police finally be called. The family were reluctant to do so, but were persuaded in the end. Law enforcement advised the family to hold a press conference to draw in publicity. By this time, six weeks had passed since Dorothy was last seen. On January 25th, 1911, reporters gathered at the conference to watch Francis Arnold tell the world his daughter was missing. He offered a reward of $1,000, which is the equivalent today of about 17,000. During the event, the press asked if it was possible that Dorothy had run off with a man, considering Francis did not allow her to date, but he denied this and told them that he'd have been glad if she'd associated with more young, busy men, saying, quote, I don't approve of young men who have nothing to do. This remark was reportedly a jab at a man Dorothy had been seeing for some time before her disappearance, 42-year-old George Grissom Jr. An engineer from a wealthy Pennsylvanian family had met Dorothy while she was studying at university. Despite his age and wealth, he continued to live with his parents in Pittsburgh. The press was quick to find out all of this information. They also found out that, months earlier, in September of 1910, Dorothy had lied to her parents, telling them she was going to visit an old classmate in Boston, but instead spending a week at a hotel with George. Francis and Mary discovered their daughter's lies when they found out she'd pawned jewelry for $500 to fund the trip, although it was apparently worth much, much more than that. Although her parents forbade her from seeing George, Dorothy continued to stay in contact with him, with the pair frequently exchanging letters. They saw each other one final time in early November. Before reaching out to the press in January of 1911, the Arnold family had contacted George to find out if he had seen their daughter or knew anything about her whereabouts. He was holidaying in Florence, Italy, so the family sent him telegrams, but George told them he knew nothing about it and denied any involvement. Later that month, on January 16th, Mary and John Arnold took the trip out to George to personally interrogate him. However, he continued to deny knowing anything. They asked him for the letters Dorothy had sent him, but he told them they contained nothing of importance and that he had already disposed of them. So the family left empty-handed. 
In the days following the announcement of Dorothy's disappearance, police widely distributed her photo, description, and information throughout America, Canada, and Mexico. The New York Times covered the story on a near daily basis, with the frenzied publicity leading to sightings all across the United States. These leads were always thoroughly investigated, but often proved to be false. At some point during this, the Arnold family received two ransom notes from alleged kidnappers, demanding $5,000 for their daughter's safe return. The authorities proved both of these to be hoaxes. As the end of January approached, authorities reported that they believed Dorothy was still alive and that she would return when she was good and ready. However, the Arnolds had already begun to make peace with the idea that their daughter may never return home. Francis Arnold told the press that he believed Dorothy had been attacked and killed while walking home through Central Park, and that her body had been thrown into the reservoir. He cited as proof two clues that he would not publicly disclose. Police refuted these claims, stating that the winter had been so cold that the reservoir had been frozen over in the days before and after the 25-year-old's disappearance. Nevertheless, the authorities did search the water when it thawed, but they found no trace of Dorothy. In February of 1911, just weeks after the conference, George returned to the United States. When questioned by the press, he simply announced to them that he had every intention of marrying Dorothy whenever she came home again. His only condition was that the couple had her mother's blessing. In response, Mary told reporters that she would never approve of the couple's relationship. Early in February, Francis received a postcard that had a New York postmark on it. It was signed by Dorothy and simply said, quote, I am safe. While the handwriting matched his daughter's, Francis believed someone had copied it from a newspaper article, which had published images of her script, and that it was some sort of cruel joke. Also around this time, a jeweler in San Francisco contacted authorities to let them know a woman he thought resembled Dorothy had come in to ask him to engrave a diamond wedding ring on January 17th. The inscription read, quote, to AJA from ERB, December 10th, 1910. Nothing further seemed to come from this lead, and it's unknown if this woman was Dorothy. Later that month, the San Francisco Chronicle published an article about several hotel clerks who'd been working where George had been staying on holiday. The staff members told the paper that they'd seen a veiled female who resembled Dorothy during George's stay. The pair were spotted having an earnest talk that they couldn't hear, but they noted that the woman looked greatly agitated. In the following months, George spent thousands of dollars placing newspaper ads in which he asked Dorothy to come home. At this point, the New York Police Department announced that they would stop looking for Dorothy, stating their belief that she was dead. There had been no clues, no trace of Dorothy in 75 days. When the authorities continued to look into reported sightings of the 25-year-old, not one of those leads panned out. There is an abundance of theories surrounding Dorothy's odd disappearance. Some believe that she slipped on an icy sidewalk on her way home, struck her head, and ended up with amnesia. But both the Pinkerton Agency and John Keith searched hospitals, and there was nobody in there matching Dorothy's description. Others have suggested that she was perhaps drugged and kidnapped, but it's important to note that the 25-year-old went missing in broad daylight from one of the busiest areas in New York, making the case all the more baffling. George Grissom Jr., Dorothy's lover, theorized that the young woman had killed herself due to her failed writing career. After her second short story was rejected, she wrote to him, stating, quote, Failure always stares me in the face. All I can see ahead is a long road with no turning. My mother will always think an accident has happened. While some friends and family believe she took her own life, many thought it was due to her crumbling relationship with George rather than her writing career. One of the main theories in many of these old cases is the idea of a botched abortion, in which Dorothy died and her body was disposed of without any of her friends or family knowing. This was given some credibility when, in April of 1916, police raided an illegal Pennsylvanian clinic. The clinic was in the basement of a home named the House of Mystery due to the number of women who visited there and never returned. The clinic was run by Dr. Meredith, Another doctor by the name of Dr. Lutz told a district attorney that Dr. Meredith had told him that Dorothy had died there after complications during the procedure and that, like many other women, her body had been burned in the furnace. While the DA believed him, 
Francis Arnold believed the story was ridiculous and absolutely untrue. That very same month, a convicted felon named Edward Glenoris, who was imprisoned in Rhode Island for attempted extortion, told an extraordinary tale to the prison warden, claiming he had been paid $250 to bury the body of a young woman in December of 1910. He said an acquaintance of his who went by Little Louie had hired him to drive a woman to and from several locations. At a home in New York, Edward and Louie met two men, one who went by the name of Doc and one who was well dressed and appeared wealthy. This man matched the description of George Jr. The men loaded the unconscious woman into the car and took her to a home in New Jersey. During the drive, little Louie told Edward that the woman was named Dorothy Arnold. Edward said he recognized her and was able to identify the signet ring she always wore on her left hand. Edward was dismissed for the day after this occurred, but was asked to return the following morning where Doc told him that the woman had died during an operation. Edward and little Louie drove the woman back to New York, wrapped her up in sheets, and buried her in the cellar of an abandoned house. Despite willingly confessing all of this to the warden when the police came to interview Edward, having been contacted by the warden himself, he denied knowing anything and refused to answer any questions, acting as if he was confused. The cellars of several homes in the area were excavated, but turned up no clues or remains. Upon hearing about this confession, Francis reportedly said that Edward was talking, quote, utter nonsense. 11 years after her disappearance in April of 1921, the case gained media attention once again when, during a lecture in New York, Captain John Ayers of the Bureau of Missing Persons claimed that Dorothy Arnold's fate was known by the Bureau and by her family, and had been for quite some time. He did not elaborate or confirm if the young woman was dead or alive. The next day, following the media uproar, the captain said he'd been misquoted and denied the notion that her fate was known to family and the Bureau. Although there is a lot of information available about Dorothy's case, it is difficult to narrow down one particular theory when so many seem possible. Sightings in the years after her disappearance all proved to be false. Letters sent to the family from women claiming to be their long lost daughter were disproven. At some point, a lawyer in California claimed that Dorothy was living under the name Ella Nevins in Los Angeles, but Francis heavily disputed this. In the weeks following Dorothy's disappearance, Francis Arnold spent around $250,000 trying to find her. That is over six million in today's money. He maintained the belief that his daughter had been kidnapped or killed around the time she went missing up until his death on April 6th, 1922. He made no provisions for his missing daughter in his will, stating that he was, quote, satisfied that she is not alive. According to family friend and lawyer John S. Keith, Mary felt differently to her husband, remaining hopeful up until the day of her death on December 29th, 1928. After her passing, John Keith stated his belief that Dorothy had taken her own life as a result of her failed writing career. Even today, over a century later, the mystery of Dorothy Arnold remains unanswered. Diane Orgut Born February 21st, 1958, Diane Louise Orgut spent most of her years living a fairly ordinary life in Florida. A stay-at-home mother to three children in the 1970s and early 80s, Diane was eventually diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which caused her life to spiral beyond her control. Following the removal of her children from her custody in 1988, and a divorce from their father in 1991, Diane began delving into the grim world of drug and alcohol abuse, often neglecting to take the medication which would help with her disorder. During the following years, she was arrested for minor offenses. According to her mother, she was taken into police custody at least 32 times under Florida's Baker Act, which allows a judge, a police officer, or a doctor to determine if an individual requires an involuntary medical exam. She was also prone to befriending the wrong people and had a tendency to trust everyone she met and could often be seen talking to herself. This combination of mental illness and a trusting nature could ultimately be what led to the disappearance of the 40-year-old in 1998. 
At the time of her disappearance, Diane was believed to be staying with her sister, Deborah, temporarily in Hudson. She was seen leaving this shared residence in Hudson on April 10th. A day later, a witness saw Diane walking north on the US-19 near New York Avenue in Hudson. She was never seen again. Fast forward a few days to April 13th, and Diane's mother, Mildred Young, came home to a chilling voicemail from her daughter, where she heard Diane say, Help! Help! Let me out! There was also a noise consistent with a scuffle taking place, and someone attempting to take the phone away. Diane then cried out, Hey, give me that! before the call ended. Upon checking the caller ID, Mildred was led to a business called Starlight in the Odessa area. But when she called the number back, it rang out without answer. When police later investigated, six establishments named Starlights were located within a 45 mile radius. However, none of them were specifically in Odessa. Armchair detectives have wondered if perhaps Starlight was the name of the LLC, but not the local business. At this point in Diane's tragic story, many have asked the question, why did Mildred not immediately contact the police? This is a reasonable question to ask, and nobody has a direct answer, although online sleuths have suggested that perhaps Mildred was just used to her daughter getting into mild trouble due to the regrettable fact that she simply often didn't take her medication. This was perhaps somewhat usual behavior. Just two weeks before Diane went missing, she'd spent several weeks in a mental facility. Mildred and other members of Diane's family agree that the 40-year-old should never have been released, citing that she needed institutionalized care. Several days later, on April 15th, Diane's severed fingertip was found at the roadside of the US 19 New York Avenue area, the same place she had been seen on April 11th. The fingernail sported the same coral color that Diane was last seen wearing, and the fingertip was specifically her right middle finger, just above the first knuckle. It was located first by a woman, but she assumed it was just a prank and left it. However, after telling her boyfriend that night, he worried that perhaps it was real, and they went to look for it the next day. According to reports, both halves of the couple described the fingertip differently, leading police to wonder if there were multiple fingertips along the roadside, but they only ever located one. The fingerprint from this severed finger matched Diane's criminal record. Also, at some point between the 10th and 18th of April, Diane's house was robbed. It is unknown if this was done in connection with her disappearance, or if it was by local teenagers who knew the house was empty. Two weeks later, and a bag of Diane's neatly folded clothing was found located inside the outdoor freezer of a convenience store where her sister Deborah worked, in Odessa. There were some conflicting reports about whether Deborah found the bag herself, but most reports state that her boss found it and then contacted her. As Diane was a regular customer, the store manager was familiar with the clothing and the bizarre circumstances surrounding the 40-year-old's disappearance. Deborah recognized the clothing as belonging to her sister as she'd recently given the items to her. The freezer had last been checked three weeks before the clothing was found inside. In 2000, a Florida newspaper called the St. Petersburg Times ran a story on Diane. A day later, a clear plastic Ziploc bag was found by Diane's brother's girlfriend, a woman named Terry, who'd gone to her local Circle K convenience store for a drink and some cigarettes. It is unknown how long the plastic bag had been sitting there, but in black marker, the word Diane had been scrawled across the front, and it contained a pink lipstick, black eyeliner, taboo perfume, and a tube of generic toothpaste. The latter being identified as the one Diane was issued with by the mental facility when she was released. While Mildred Young confirmed that the belongings in the bag looked like those that her daughter might have, it couldn't be conclusively proved by law enforcement to have belonged to Diane. There is much debate surrounding the plastic Ziploc bag, with many online sleuths noting the coincidental timing of its discovery, since it was found just one day after a local newspaper reported on the story again, gaining some traction. Many believe the family planted the bag there to try and get the case more attention, 
but there is no evidence of this. Others have proposed that the bag was Diane's and that she'd had it from leaving the mental hospital. The bag and the fact that her name was written on it in marker resembles the kind of thing carried out of hospitals. After 2000, however, Diane's case largely goes cold. Sometime between the 11th and 14th of April in 1998, witnesses placed the 40-year-old at the Coral Sands Motel, which was managed at the time by a man named Gary Evers and his girlfriend. Three years later, in 2001, Gary was charged with murder after allegedly shooting and killing a man he thought had robbed him. The real robbers were later caught and charged. Although Gary had no prior record in Florida, law enforcement suspects that he might possibly have been involved in Diane's disappearance, but there is no evidence to bring charges against him. In the weeks following Diane's disappearance, there were several witness sightings reported on the Doe Network. On April 10th, a bartender at the Hayloft Tavern at Little Road and State Road 52 believes he saw and served Diane that day, but he cut her off when she began to act strangely and walk in circles. Since Diane didn't have a car, it's widely believed that she either went with friends or hitchhiked her way there. On the 13th, the same day Diane left her mother the disturbing voicemail, a waitress at the inn on the Gulf in Hudson claims to have seen the 40-year-old eating lunch. Theories about what happened to Diane are scarce. Law enforcement believes that she has met with foul play, although others have wondered if perhaps Diane lost her fingertip not in some malicious maiming, but maybe in a slamming car door or some other tragic accident. Some online speculators have also proposed the idea that perhaps Diane decided to leave and start again, and so she staged her own disappearance or suicide. But if this is truly the case, the removal of one's own finger seems extraordinarily severe. If she is still alive, Diane is 62 years old and missing her right middle finger. Her disappearance remains unsolved. Faith Hedgepeth. Faith Hedgepeth was born on September 26th, 1992 in Warren County to Connie and Roland Hedgepeth, who divorced within the first year that their second child entered the world. Faith was a member of the Haliwa Saponi Native American tribe and had a sister who was 18 years her senior. Growing up, Faith lived with her mother and her big sister Rolanda, who essentially acted as a second mother to her. Throughout school, Faith was an honor student, a cheerleader, and a member of multiple clubs and activities. She was intelligent, popular, and friendly, and worked hard to secure herself a scholarship. She was considering entering into a teaching or pediatrician career, and hoped to be the first in her family to graduate from university. In 2012, Faith was an undergraduate in her third year at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. At the time of her death in September, the 19-year-old was temporarily staying in an off-campus, one-bedroom apartment at the Hawthorne between Chapel Hill and Durham. She was staying with one other student, Karina, whom she had known since freshman year, but planned to move out on her own when her financial aid came through. For some time during her stay, Karina had her boyfriend living with them too. Eric Jones was extremely violent and would often assault his girlfriend. Eventually, Karina ended the relationship and he moved out. But that wasn't the last that the young women would see of Eric. In early 2012, just months prior to Faith's death, Eric attempted to break into the apartment twice. He also reportedly resented Faith for her influence over Karina, and during a phone call with her, he threatened to kill her if he couldn't get back together with his ex-girlfriend. On the night of September 6th, 2012, after spending some time at the library, Karina and Faith returned home to the apartment and then headed out again at 12.30 a.m. to a nightclub called The Thrill. The club was apparently open to under 21s who wanted to dance. The pair arrived at 12.40 a.m. and after approximately one and a half hours of dancing, they left as Karina said she had an upset stomach and was feeling unwell. The two women left the club just after 2 a.m. 
Around 3 a.m., a woman who lived below the shared apartment who was awake and watching TV noted hearing three thumps, like furniture being overturned or a heavy bag being dropped. At this time, Faith's Facebook was accessed. Then, at 3.40 a.m., a text was sent from Faith's phone to one of Karina's ex-boyfriends, a man named Brandon Edwards. It read, Hey, B, can you come over here, please? Rosaria, which is Karina's last name, needs you more, aha. You know. Please let her know you care. Three minutes later, another text was sent. It simply read, Van, and is believed to have been a spelling correction to the word, aha, in the previous text. At 4.16 a.m., Brandon responded to the text, asking who was sending them. Meanwhile, Karina's phone records show that she tried to call Brandon around this time, but he didn't answer. She then rang a football player she knew, Jordan McCrary, who picked her up from the apartment around 4.25 a.m. According to Karina, she left Faith asleep in the bedroom and left the apartment door unlocked. It's unknown exactly why she did this, considering just a few months ago, her abusive ex-boyfriend had been trying to gain access to the apartment. Karina and Jordan drove to the home of an acquaintance of theirs, arriving just after 4.30 in the morning. Six hours later, at half past 10 in the morning, she decided to try and get home. She called Faith, but there was no answer. So instead, she phoned a friend who drove over to pick Karina up just before 11 a.m. Back at the apartment, Karina and her friend entered, calling out for Faith. When she didn't answer, they made their way through to the bedroom where they found her bloodied, wrapped up in a quilt and nude from the waist down. She was face up and hanging half off the bed. There is much speculation about the 911 call made by Karina at this point. Some online sleuths and even a few journalists believe that the voice on the other end of the line isn't Karina at all, but is the voice of her friend who gave Karina's name instead of her own for unknown reasons. Others have wondered why the two young women decided to stay in the apartment after making such a horrifying discovery and knowing that an attacker had not long left. It's also noted that Karina seems very reluctant to check if Faith is actually still alive or not. A neighbor who was interviewed by Crime Watch Daily noted that she was shocked when she found out a murder had occurred in the apartment. And when she saw the girls leaving home, Karina's friend was crying, but Karina herself was on the phone and appeared calm. Faith had been bludgeoned to death, specifically with a bottle of Bacardi rum. The bottle was intact. Semen was found at the scene, although whether Faith was sexually assaulted or not is hard to say, as the majority of reports, and even police themselves, are unclear about this. Faith's older sister, Rolanda, told Crime Watch Daily, quote, I'm not quite sure why they won't exactly say she was raped. It's possible the semen from the scene was from someone Faith had had consensual sex with, but if that's the case, why haven't they come forward? Some online sleuths have speculated that the semen was some kind of red herring, as the investigation feels somewhat stalled until police have a match. But the semen does match other DNA samples found around the apartment. Of course, the initial suspect in Faith's case was Karina's ex-boyfriend, Eric Jones. Given his violent past and the fact he had threatened the young woman, it seemed likely that he was responsible for her demise. On the night before the murder, he had texted an acquaintance around 6 p.m. asking for forgiveness, quote, for all I am about to do. He also tweeted it. Three days later, he made a Facebook status reading, quote, dear Lord, forgive me for all my sins and the sins I may commit today. Protect me from the girls who don't deserve me and the ones who wish me dead today. All of this combined seems very ominous. However, Eric's DNA did not match the semen or other samples found in the apartment. Reportedly, Brandon Edwards, along with several other men from the nightclub who'd been seen with the young women, were also given DNA tests, but none of them matched the samples from the crime scene. 
Within days of the horrifying crime, the university's board of trustees, the local Crime Stoppers chapter, the apartment complex, and the Hallower Saponi tribe had put together $29,000 in reward money for anyone who could lead police to an arrest. Police hoped this would encourage people to speak out, especially given their own limited resources, but sadly, it did not. Two months later, the Northern Carolina governor added a further $10,000 to the reward, but this still did not entice answers. The investigation into Faith's brutal and unjust passing by Chapel Hill police was kept tightly under wraps. For several years, evidence and records were kept sealed to news reporters and even the family. This led to a lot of controversy in the case, with many journalists and even the local student paper believing that the police were attempting to cover up huge mistakes in the initial investigation. This was given further credence when, in April of 2014, a reporter called Chelsea Dullany took it upon herself to speak to neighbours and locals and discover what they knew. Two neighbours reportedly told her that while the police sealed off the four unit block with crime scene tape, they only searched Faith's apartment and nobody else's. They also neglected to explore the woods behind the apartments. The authorities only then returned once to investigate one other flat. They apparently did not canvass the area or carry out interviews with neighbours and Faith's car was left unsecured while police searched her apartment. Dullany also spoke to the owner of a towing company who had the contract for the Thrills parking lot. He had CCTV in place, but police didn't ask for it for months after the slaying, and by that time, the footage had already been recorded over. Throughout the first several years of the investigation, there was much back and forth between the student paper at Faith's University, other local papers, and the authorities about releasing the information they had. Time and time again, locals petitioned to have the information released, but every time, a judge would reseal the investigation documents for a further one, two, or three months. In January of 2013, police announced that the DNA they'd found at the crime scene belonged to a male. Following this, the FBI developed a profile. They believed the unidentified man likely lived near her in the past, expressed an interest in her, and would have changed his behavior since the crime, likely being overly and unusually interested in the case. In September 2013, the records were still sealed. The Chapel Hill PD requested the assistance of the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, which helped out in the early days of the investigation. In March of 2014, the Daily Tar Heel, which was the University of North Carolina's student paper, came together with other local news companies to oppose the district attorney's motion to extend the seal on the records for another 60 days. The DA argued that the investigation would be hindered if the records were released, and so they remained sealed. Finally, in July of 2014, the records were released. A few months later, Faith's autopsy report was released, confirming that she had passed away from blunt force trauma. She had numerous cuts and bruises, injuries to her hands and blood under her fingernails, suggesting that she put up a ferocious fight against her attacker. One of the most peculiar clues found at the scene of the crime, however, was an odd note left near Faith's body on the bed. It read, quote, I'm not stupid, bitch. Jealous. It appeared to be written in ballpoint pen on a white paper bag, like those used for takeaways. The bag is believed to have possibly come from Time Out, a popular 24-hour restaurant in Chapel Hill that would have been the only place open at the time Karina and Faith left the club. The pen used to write this note had on it the same DNA as those other samples found around the apartment. Although investigators haven't done analysis of the handwriting, Crime Watch Daily hired Peggy Waller to take a look at the evidence. Since the paper was clean of blood, it was either written before the homicide took place or was written somewhere outside the bedroom. The note was, possibly, written using someone's non-dominant hand as a means to disguise their own script, and the person writing it was particularly agitated. Journalists and armchair detectives alike have speculated about other theories. Was the writing meant to be read in a different order? For example, I'm not jealous, stupid bitch, makes more sense. Or maybe there were multiple writers. 
others have wondered also about whether the takeaway bag was maybe used to write notes back and forth between two people, perhaps while one of them was on the phone. It's also been suggested that perhaps the note was a red herring. Why would the killer leave a note like that? It seems to pit evidence against themselves, which seems rather redundant. Besides, by the time the note was left, Faith was already deceased. So what point was there in leaving it behind? Then another startling piece of evidence came to light. Faith was reportedly well known by her friends to pocket dial people, and this occurred on the night of her murder. The friend didn't answer the call, so a voicemail was left. It's extremely difficult to make out anything on the voicemail, but Faith can be heard alongside at least one man and one other woman. The message was left at 1.23 a.m. on September 7th. At this time, Faith and Karina would have been in the club. Crime Watch Daily hired an audio expert named Arlo West to try and enhance the recording to make the dialogue understandable. With this in mind, Arlo's findings have received a mixed reaction. While some think he's onto something, others have attempted to discredit him. According to Arlo, he can hear Faith screaming and crying in some sections of the voicemail, at one point saying, get off me. While another point, a male says, I think she's dying, and a female voice says, do it anyhow. He also believes he hears the name Rosie and Eric, with Rosie being a nickname for Karina Rosario. Another male voice is believed to say, just throw it in the river, and mention duct tape. Arlo believes that on the recording, there are multiple male parties and two females, with one of those being Faith. Her own father believes it's her voice screaming on the voicemail. While some people believe that this was a fight occurring in the club, Arlo West disagrees, stating his belief that this was a recording of Faith being attacked at home. He sent Chapel Hill PD the recording along with his transcript, but the authorities are unsure what to make of it, considering they placed Faith's death around four in the morning. Arlo, however, pointed out that there was a glitch on iPhones that sometimes made voicemails appear three hours behind. In September of 2016, the police revealed an image generated by Parabon Nanolabs, a genetic testing company in Virginia. The image was of what the suspect might look like based on his DNA profile. The suspect is described as being strongly Native American and European mixed ancestry, or possibly Latino. Most genetic markers pointed towards Mexican and Colombian ancestry, with other South American or African countries making up the balance. With over 80% confidence, it's believed the suspect would have an olive skin tone, with either a few freckles or none, and black hair. Authorities believe that Faith's slaying was not a crime of opportunity but that it was carried out by someone in her social group. Of the 2,000 people authorities interviewed, 750 had DNA samples taken. From mapping the relations between each other and between Faith, police narrowed their suspect pool down from 1,000 to 10 people. One journalist from the News and Observer, who has been extremely vocal about the case, Tom Gasparoli said in 2017 that he believed the killer was probably just outside Faith's social group, as otherwise, investigators would know who it was by now. Perhaps the killer was acting out in anger at some sort of grievance the 19-year-old caused someone else close to her. The most common theory in Faith's case is that Karina was the one to kill her. Jordan may have provided her with an alibi, but many point out her shady behavior of leaving the door unlocked and the way she acted on the phone as being indicators of knowing more than she is letting on. It also appears to some that Faith was killed in some sort of fit of rage and the killer used whatever was to hand. In this case, a bottle of alcohol. Online sleuths suggested that the pair argued that night and Karina accidentally or purposefully killed Faith and that maybe Karina was jealous of her friend. Others proposed the theory that Karina's ex-boyfriend, Brandon Edwards, had some sort of fling or feelings for Faith, and that Faith reciprocated them, which led to a fight between the two roommates. Perhaps the access to Faith's Facebook account was Karina checking her messages for ones from Brandon. It is widely believed that Karina Rosario and Eric Jones removed their social media platforms shortly after Faith's death, but many reports don't comment on this aspect of the story. 
Regardless, Karina has left North Carolina since the murder, and while she was apparently cooperative with the police, she refuses to speak with interviewers and journalists. Eric is much the same, declining to speak with reporters often. While so far in the case there are no publicly known persons of interest or suspects, the police are extremely confident that with Faith's homicide, it's not a matter of if the killer gets caught, but simply a matter of when. Stephen Kubaki. Stephen Kubaki has one of the most bizarre cases of someone who went missing and later reappeared. In 1978, Stephen was 23 years old and studying German at a small, private Christian university. At the time he went missing, he was not known to be upset, depressed, or stressed with anything going on in his life. He was a smart, capable young man who had everything going for him, including a job with a newspaper lined up after he graduated. He had no complications in his love life, and reportedly, his father had intentions of signing his house over to his son. On February 20th, 1978, Stephen went missing from an area in Michigan known as the Lake Michigan Triangle. The triangle has been associated with various peculiar events over the years, beginning in 1891. And for a short time, it was thought that Stephen's case was linked with this mystery. Stephen had plans to go skiing that afternoon, but he never made it back home. A day after he was due to return, his family notified authorities that the young man was missing. Search teams were swiftly dispatched, and authorities wasted no time in launching an investigation. Stephen's skis and poles were located on the shore of Lake Michigan, and footprints were found on the ice leading towards the lake. A group of snowboarders uncovered his backpack, which contained a dentist bill, allowing them to identify to whom it belonged. During this search for the 23-year-old, a rescue crew flew over the area. The footprints they spotted appeared to stop at the edge of the ice, which was unbroken. A further search of the area turned up no more clues. There was no sign of Stephen for over a year. It was assumed by law enforcement that the young man had fallen and drowned in the lake. A month after he went missing, in March of 1978, a family friend was given names and numbers by an unidentified caller to contact in connection with the disappearance, but the numbers were all disconnected. Stephen's mother later found out that Stephen had called from one of the numbers before, six months prior, but she didn't know who or where the number belonged to. While police traced the previous number, they were never publicly named, and their name never came up when the police files were later looked over by journalists, suggesting that perhaps this person was ultimately ruled out of investigation. Detectives working the case even went so far as to send Stephen's dental records to Chicago to see if the 23-year-old had become a victim of the serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. 15 months after Stephen's disappearance, on May 5th, 1979, he appeared at his father's door. His father, a 53-year-old retired factory worker, was overjoyed that his son had finally come home, but naturally he was confused. However, Stephen appeared even more confused when he found out that he had been missing for so long. According to his own accounts, the young man had woken up in Pittsfield, 700 miles from Michigan and 40 miles from his father's home. He was lying in a meadow, and when he woke, he was wearing clothing that did not belong to him. Next to him, Stephen had found a small satchel. There were maps inside that he didn't recognize as being his. He also found hitchhiking signs that suggested he'd been to Utah, Chicago, San Francisco, and Sacramento. There was $40 in cash and a new pair of glasses. When asked about what happened, Stephen suggested that perhaps he had suffered a combination of exhaustion and a loss of body heat like mountain climbers do. He knew this from experience as he'd previously climbed mountains in Europe. This combination can result in a temporary loss of memory. He also added that he had vague feelings and a new pair of running shoes, saying, quote, I feel like I've done a lot of running. I have also a marathon t-shirt from Wisconsin, 
I don't know how I got it. Stephen's name was not registered as being entered into the marathon that occurred in Wisconsin of that year, 1978. Upon his return, reporters repeatedly asked Stephen if he would speak to a professional, but he told them he didn't need to because he didn't have any psychological problems and had nothing to say about the 15 months that he was missing. Sometime after 1983, Stephen gained a master's degree in linguistics and a PhD in clinical psychology. He did not take the newspaper job he'd originally had lined up and had received the bachelor's degree in absentia from Hope College the year he went missing. Overall, Stephen Kubaki is a very accomplished individual, but still will not elaborate on the 15 months he went missing. Even his ex-wife refused to give newspapers any information that she might have. Without answers, of course, people speculate. Many have wondered whether Stephen suffered from a fugue state, which is a disassociative disorder and a rare psychiatric disorder characterized by reversible amnesia for personal identity, including things like memories and characteristics of individuality. It can last days, months, or even longer. Stephen was described by those who knew him as, quote, a little more free-spirited than the average student, which has led other online sleuths to speculate that Stephen left of his own volition, with some suggesting he ended up in a cult, embarrassed by where he'd been, or perhaps not wishing to stir up trouble with the group he'd escaped from. Others have suggested that he simply wanted a break, and felt like the only way he could go about it was to drop off the map entirely. Whatever happened to Stephen Kubaki for those lost 15 months, it seems that we will simply never know. William Bates William Horatio Bates was born December 23rd, 1860, in Newark, New Jersey. He graduated from Cornell University in 1881 and received his medical degree from Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1885. He was frequently consulted in unusual cases, although he specialized in eye care. William was renowned in his field for his approach to correcting vision disorders, which he based on psychological principles unusual for the time. That said, just because he was renowned did not mean that he was revered by his fellow professionals, but we will touch on this later. Just hours before William went missing, on August 30th, 1902, he wrote a hurried letter to his wife, Ada, who was out of town visiting her mother. The letter explained that he had been called out of town for work and that he would write her the details later. He also mentioned being excited about the money he had earned from this, which is often seen as an odd detail, considering the 42-year-old was a wealthy and influential man anyway. However, William did not write to his wife later, as promised. He didn't come home either, and in his original letter, he had never stated where he was going. After several days, Ada began to ask her friends and family, who spanned across the US and Europe, whether they'd seen or heard from her husband. William was a prominent figure amongst the Masons, and so Ada enlisted the help from the Masonic Society to locate her husband. His picture was widely circulated. Eventually, a letter arrived from the United Kingdom. A man fitting William's description was found working as a medical assistant at Charing Cross Hospital in London. He had initially been admitted as a patient and was said to have looked haggard, thin, and his eyes were deeply sunken. William later admitted that he recalled starving at various points in the six weeks prior, despite his enormous wealth. Ada boarded the next boat for England, but when she arrived, she was devastated to find that William didn't recognize her. He had no recollection of his life before London. He was, however, coaxed into spending some time with her, and as the days wore on, he began to vaguely remember that he'd been called away to board a ship and perform surgery. Ada had every intention of staying in London with him until he recovered, but two days later, William left the hotel and she never saw him again. She continued to search for him, never losing hope, but died before she could locate her husband in 1907. When William was found again, it was in Grand Forks, North Dakota, 
In 1910, another doctor and good friend of Williams passed through, and at some point bumped into and recognised him. The now 50-year-old had set up a small practice in the town, but his friend managed to persuade him to return to New York, where the two friends set up their own practice together. William never recovered his memories. He went on to serve as an attending physician at Harlem Hospital, and eventually he married again. In 1917, he debuted the Bates System of Exercises in a magazine run by a quote, notorious health quack. The article went down well and boosted magazine subscriptions. In 1920, he published a book made up of bizarre misinformation and exaggeration. His new cure-all concepts were at odds with everything he had been taught and learned in the last several decades of his practice. His new methods saw him revered by the public, but put him at odds with his colleagues. William Bates died on July 10th, 1931, aged 70, and it's unknown what exactly caused his loss of memory. His New York Times obituary said that he suffered a strange form of aphasia, but this is a disorder that primarily limits one's communication abilities, rather than wiping out one's entire memory. Some have speculated that he suffered from retrograde amnesia, while others have wondered if he was the victim of a disassociative fugue, which occurs in roughly 0.2% of the population. Many others, however, have suggested that he perhaps walked away from his old life of his own volition. Perhaps he was in debt, or grew tired of his life and marriage. Whatever the explanation, the life and story of William Bates is one of the most bizarre and curious cases of the late 19th century. John Darwin John Darwin was born August 14th, 1950, in Hartlepool, County Durham. He married Anne Stevenson in December of 1973. After their wedding, John went on to teach maths and science at a local school for eight years, before switching to a job at Barclays, and then getting employment as a prison officer. Anne worked as a receptionist at a doctor's office, and the couple also had a joint business where they rented out bedsits in the County Durham area. However, things for the couple took a turn for the worse in 2000, when they ran into debt after purchasing two houses. These purchases racked up tens of thousands of pounds in debt. John was last seen paddling out to sea in his kayak on March 21st, 2002, at a small seaside resort in the borough of Hartlepool. After he failed to turn up to work that day, a missing persons report was filed for him, and a large-scale sea search was launched for the missing 52-year-old. 62 miles of coastline was searched, but turned up no sign of John but for his double-ended paddle. The next day, on March 22nd, his kayak was retrieved. The sea had been unusually calm over the last day, leaving rescuers puzzled as to how he could possibly have gotten into trouble. But John had not fallen victim to the sea. In fact, during the first few years that he was missing, he lived next to the family home in one of the bedsits. In February 2003, he secretly moved back in with his wife. While Anne had been publicly grieving for her lost husband, she had been in on John's plan the entire time. The couple had planned to fake John's death so that they could collect on his life insurance policy and thus they could pay off their debts and still have money left to spend. The couple's two sons were adults and living alone, so John and Anne weren't worried about getting caught. A death certificate for John was issued in 2003, listing his date of death as March 21st, 2002. This allowed Anne to collect on her husband's life insurance policy. Reportedly, £25,000 was paid out, as well as a much larger sum that paid off the couple's £130,000 mortgage. Meanwhile, at some point in 2003, one of the tenants of the bedsit saw John, but said he didn't tell police because he, quote, didn't want to get involved. In 2004, Anne and John considered moving abroad and had their sights set on Cyprus. They visited in November of that year to look at a property. John had applied for a passport under a false name, John Jones, but used his real address. He later went abroad again to look at buying a £45,000 boat at some point that year. 
In 2006, the couple began to consider buying a property in Panama rather than Cyprus. They flew to the country in July and were photographed by a Panamanian property agent. This photo was posted online, though it was not discovered for quite some time. The following year, in March 2007, Anne and John formed Jaguar Properties and bought a two-bedroom apartment in El Dorado for £50,000. Proceeds for this came from the sale of the bedsit they had next to their home in the UK. A month later, Anne returned alone to England to sell the family home, and in May, they bought a £200,000 tropical estate near the Panama Canal with the intention of building a hotel. Police launched an investigation into Anne and her husband's death in September of 2007, when a colleague overheard a phone call between the couple. A month later, the family home sold for £295,000 and Anne left for Panama. However, a change in Panama's visa laws caused John to email his wife on June 14th, 2007. Passports and IDs now had to be verified by UK police in order for British citizens to get Panama investors visas. John was aware that under that much scrutiny, his false identity would never hold up. So instead, he hatched a plan to turn himself in while faking amnesia. On December 1st, 2007, John walked into West End Central Police Station in London, claiming to have no memory of the last five years. When Anne was told this news, she acted as though she was shocked, but full of joy to be finally reunited with her long-lost husband. However, police were already suspicious of the pair. Given Anne's frequent trips abroad, the transfer of large sums of money, and the selling of the family home. Then, the Daily Mirror published the image of the couple when they were in Panama in 2006, and the entire story began to unravel in the eyes of the public with John being dubbed as the canoe man by the British media. Anne confirmed that the photo was of her and her supposedly dead husband, and John was arrested while visiting one of his sons. More damning evidence surfaced when police found the passport of John Jones, and that John had made several trips abroad while using this false passport. Prior to the story unfolding, John's sons had been ecstatic to find their father alive, but after the scam came to light, they expressed their disapproval and publicly announced that they wished to have no further contact with either of their parents. In 2008, Anne and John Darwin were convicted of fraud. John faced additional charges relating to his fake passport. In the end, Anne was sentenced to six years and six months, while John was sentenced to six years and three months. Both appealed these sentences and both were rejected. The couple were released on probation in 2011, and all their properties and assets were seized so they could repay what they owed. Following their release from prison, Anne and John divorced. Reportedly, John had written to another woman while they were in jail, boasting of his, quote, high sex drive, and claiming that he was leaving his wife. Upon hearing this, Anne severed ties with her husband. In February 2015, John, 64 years old, married a Filipino woman in her 30s. That same year, Anne was known to be working with the RSPCA, living a quiet, honest life. She has since repaired her relationship with her two sons, though it is unclear as to whether the pair ever forgave their father for faking his own death. Charles and Catherine Rommer. At 3.51 p.m. on Tuesday, April 8th, 1980, Charles and Catherine Rommer checked into their hotel and took their belongings to their room. The elderly couple were staying in the Holiday Inn located along the I-95 and US-341 in Brunswick, Georgia. They were traveling from Miami, Florida, where they had a winter house, back to their home in Scarsdale, New York. Later that day, around 5 p.m., a Georgia Highway patrolman saw the couple's car south of Brunswick, near a group of restaurants. The car was rather distinct, which is probably why it stuck with him. It was a black, two-door 1978 Lincoln Continental, with New York plates reading C-R-R-C-B-R. -R -R. This is the last known sighting of their car, which has never been located since the couple went missing. 
Several days later, on Friday, April 11th, the staff at the Holiday Inn notified police that they hadn't seen the pair check in and that their room did not appear to have been occupied since they'd dropped off their belongings. The police opened an investigation into the disappearance of the couple. During a search of the room, the police found glasses, a bottle of scotch, and tax returns. They also uncovered Charles's last diary entry from April 7th, which indicated that they would be back in New York by April 10th. Charles, born August 27th, 1906, was 73 years old at the time of his disappearance. He was described as an extremely meticulous man, and family and friends believed it was not likely that he would deviate from his plan. The investigation quickly picked up pace. Authorities searched swamps and back roads and utilized both helicopters and drivers, searching for some clue that might lead them to the whereabouts or to learn the fate of the missing couple. They also searched the restaurants and service stations along 120 miles of interstate between the Florida line and Savannah, Georgia. Charles's sons even hired a PI to help with the investigation. Several theories began to take shape in the eyes of authorities and the private investigator. The main theory is that the couple were victims of a robbery and were perhaps killed for the jewelry they adorned themselves with. Charles was a retired Sinclair Oil executive. He lived a lavish lifestyle and had a great deal of personal wealth. Catherine, who was born in July of 1902 and was 77 at the time of her disappearance, married Charles in 1974 after his first marriage fell through. She reportedly left behind $500,000 worth of jewelry just at the hotel room and often wore anything between eighty dollars to $150,000 worth of jewelry at any time. Others have speculated that the couple was run off the road or perhaps missed a bridge and ended up in a river or swamp while heading to an off the beaten path restaurant. Fishermen near Jekyll Island reported seeing a couple matching their description, but due to the timing of the sighting, authorities suspect that the two couples were not one and the same. In 2004, a woman said her late husband was run off the road by a car resembling the couple's. However, drivers that searched the surrounding area returned to shore empty-handed. There was also an unconfirmed sighting of the pair chatting to a young couple with a small dog. Despite the effort authorities put into locating Charles and Catherine Romer, they have yet to be found. Charles's sons regularly made trips back to Georgia to help keep the case alive, although all these years later, it's unknown if they continue to do so. One of the drivers from the initial marine searches also continues to search for clues in his free time. This man, George Baker, had made 315 searches for them by 1998. However, for all the speculation and searching, it seems that the couple and their car simply vanished from the face of the earth. Sadly, the case of Catherine and Charles Romer remains unsolved and inactive. Ryan Singleton In July of 2013, a model, aspiring writer, and filmmaker, Ryan Singleton, flew from his family home in Atlanta, Georgia, to Los Angeles, California. From here, he rented a car so that he could drive to Las Vegas. It's unknown what exactly the purpose of this trip was, although some report that it was simply meant to be a vacation. The 24-year-old was six foot four and described by friends and family as kind and gentle. For many, his case is cut and dry, but for others, it's not so simple. And what happened to him that summer is still widely discussed seven years later. Around July 9th, Ryan was driving his car through the desolate Mojave Desert. He was on his way back from Las Vegas. The car broke down near Baker, California, and a highway patrolman gave him a lift to the nearest rest stop at a gas station so he could call for help. The patrolman had reportedly picked up Ryan while he walked along the road, but when the pair went to look for his car, it wasn't there. He also apparently had suffered attacks by animals while walking from his car. At the stop, Ryan called one of his friends, TK, using his mobile. He also called his mother and asked her to send him the $100 he had in his bedroom at home, as he was running low on funds. She agreed, did what he asked, and then attempted to call him back so she could pass along the tracking number for the money. But he never answered his phone. 
Ryan continued to not respond to calls and texts made to his mobile. In fact, these phone communications were the last time the 24-year-old was heard from. When TK, who lived three hours away, arrived at the rest stop, Ryan was nowhere to be found. The young man's sudden disappearance was very quickly reported to local law enforcement. The following day, on July 10th, Ryan's car was located a few miles north of where he and the officer had been looking for it, and on July 11th, his mother found out that her son had been receiving financial help from numerous people. It's unknown why Ryan's trip was being funded by others, or what exactly it was that they were funding. Two and a half months later, on September 21st, Ryan's body was found by joggers about two miles from the gas station. He was fully clothed but for his shirt, which was missing, and most of his organs were gone. He was also missing much of his skin, several ribs, and some of his teeth. He was almost entirely skeletal. His remains weighed just 50 pounds. After the initial gruesome discovery, there was much speculation surrounding Ryan's case. Everyone who read about it seemed to immediately suspect that the young man had fallen victim to organ harvesters, but this is heavily disputed by experts, who explain that it's much more likely that his organs were taken by scavenging animals. Organ harvesting is also apparently not as common as many people seem to think and experts on the case have repeatedly said that there are easier ways to go about obtaining organs. The main discrepancy in Ryan's post-mortem is that he appeared to have suffered a skull fracture. However, once again, experts have debunked this, claiming it was an injury that occurred after death. Due to the state of decomposition, a cause of death could not be determined by the medical examiner. For many, the animal scavenging hypothesis is an acceptable answer for the state of Ryan's body and is much more believable than an organ harvesting ring was responsible. What throws up more questions, however, is much of Ryan's backstory and the investigation that took place after he went missing. Ryan was 21 when he began to pursue his dreams of being a model. He moved to New York and quickly began to receive modeling gigs. These all went well for him, but then he decided to set his sights on the bright lights of Hollywood. He and two of his friends made the trip to LA, filming the entire adventure and turning it into a docu-series called Are We Famous Yet? After some time, Ryan returned to New York, where he got married to a man twice his age. His mother found out about this via Facebook. She did not know Ryan's new spouse and had never met him. However, the marriage quickly crumbled, and Ryan returned home to his mother in Georgia in the spring of 2013. His spouse called Ryan's mother that summer while he was away in California. He claimed that the 24-year-old was in danger, but did not elaborate on why or how. Meanwhile, Ryan had asked his mother not to tell his spouse where he was, but she revealed his location to him when she grew concerned, having not heard from her son in several days. According to Ryan's spouse, when the pair last spoke, the young man sounded like he'd been drinking. However, none of the law enforcement officers who encountered Ryan noticed this, and his autopsy in September of 2013 showed that he had no traces of drugs or alcohol in his system. But things became stranger still when it was found that the car Ryan had rented appeared to have been wiped down. There was no trace of evidence or fingerprints in the vehicle. It was also found to have contained his backpack and mobile phone, the same phone he'd used to contact friends and family when he was last heard from. It's unknown how this occurred, since earlier that day, Ryan couldn't find his car. His last movements are shrouded in mystery. Then, in 2017, California Highway Patrol and Nevada Highway Patrol both claimed to have no record of Ryan interacting with members of their departments. Family and friends can't figure out why anyone would want to kill Ryan, although his former spouse doesn't believe that he simply collapsed and died, speculating that he was, perhaps, a victim of a hate crime. Although it seems likely Ryan's organs weren't harvested, the circumstances surrounding his death are disturbing and peculiar nonetheless. As of 2020, no one can really be sure what exactly happened in Ryan's tragic final hours. Judy Bradford 
Judy Bradford was working as a home care nurse in Boston in the mid 80s when she met lawyer Jeffrey Smith. Judy cared for Jeffrey's father following an operation he had had on his throat. Twice divorced with two children from her second marriage, Judy began a relationship with Jeffrey, and after 10 years together, the pair got married in 1996. Eight months into their marriage, the couple decided to attend a conference together in Philadelphia from April 9th to April 11th, 1997. The plan was that Judy would explore the city during the day while Jeffrey attended the conference, and then they would meet up in the evening. They also had intentions of spending the rest of the week afterwards visiting New Jersey. The flight out to Philadelphia was from Logan International Airport on April 9th. However, things didn't go to plan when Judy realized she'd left her driver's license at home. Recent regulation changes required airlines to verify passenger IDs before boarding. She told Jeffrey to go ahead on the flight and that she'd catch the next one once she'd been home to retrieve her ID. The pair caught up with one another that night in the lobby of the Doubletree Hotel in Center City, Philadelphia, where the conference was being held. The next day, after breakfast, Jeffrey headed to the first day's session, while Judy made her own plans to visit tourist spots before heading back to the hotel for a conference cocktail party with her husband at 6 p.m. Later on, as it neared time for the party, Jeffrey went to the couple's shared room, but found that his other half wasn't there. Assuming she had gotten confused about their arrangement and had already headed to the party, Jeffrey went downstairs to look for her. However, Judy wasn't there. For a while, he bounced between the party and their room, hoping to bump into her, but Judy never appeared. He then informed hotel staff, who called local hospitals to see if Judy had turned up there. Meanwhile, Jeffrey left the party and paid a taxi to follow the route of the tour bus Judy had told him she'd be using that day but there was no sign of her. He then called his stepchildren, asking them to check for any phone messages she might have left. It was midnight by the time Jeffrey tried to report his wife missing, but he was told by police that he had to wait at least until morning, if not the full 24 hours, before he could file a missing person report. After a sleepless night of tossing and turning, Jeffrey called police first thing that morning. This time he was successful in listing his wife as a missing person. Four days later, police speculated about whether Judy, 51 at the time, was having some sort of midlife crisis and whether perhaps she had disappeared for attention. They then wondered if she had ever come to Philadelphia in the first place. They couldn't understand how Judy, an experienced solo traveler, could forget her driver's license, but Jeffrey repeatedly explained that she had only flown once since the new regulations were put in place 18 months earlier. According to authorities, only one witness could corroborate seeing Judy at the hotel, and there was no guest register either to help place her there. Several reported sightings were called in to authorities as media coverage of the case grew, but most of these are not deemed to be credible. One homeless man did identify Judy by her photo and told the family on April 15th that they had just missed her, but Judy was never found in the area. A detective who searched the room noted that there were no cosmetics and that Judy's remaining clothing hadn't been worn, suggesting that she'd worn the same outfit two days in a row. However, her daughter confirmed that this was usual behavior for her mother when she went traveling. Then Jeffrey refused to take a lie detector test. He requested that the FBI administer it and that if he passed, the police department request the FBI's help to work the investigation. The police claimed that Jeffrey had said this after knowing the FBI wouldn't join and that he refused when they made the offer that the Massachusetts State Police would handle the polygraph test instead of the local PD. While police continued on with the investigation, Jeffrey worked hard at trying to bring home his missing wife. He hired two private investigators, put up posters with her children and faxed Judy's picture and information to hospitals up and down the country, hoping that someone, somewhere, had answers. On September 7th of 1997, five months after Judy was last seen, a father and son out hunting in an area of North Carolina's Pisgah National Forest found what appeared to be human bones near the Stony Fork picnic area along Chestnut Creek, a little over nine miles from Asheville. The bones had been scattered, most likely by wildlife, and at the center of this area was a shallow grave where the majority of the clothed skeleton remained, still partially buried. 
The medical examiner determined that the bones belonged to a white woman aged between 40 and 55, with extensive dental work and arthritis in one knee. Cut marks on the ribs and clothing indicated that she had died from being repeatedly stabbed, and the case was ruled as homicide. An ER doctor in North Carolina who saw the discovered body in the media thought it might possibly be Judy, whose information he had received by fax. He let the police know his suspicions. Detectives then requested Judy's dental records, which were then forwarded to the medical examiner. By the end of September, it had been confirmed. The skeletal body found in the forest was that of missing 51-year-old Judy Bradford. The Buncombe Sheriff's Office led the investigation into her murder. It was determined that the clothes Judy wore were not the same ones she had been wearing when she was last seen by Jeffrey and other witnesses. She was clad in jeans, thermal underwear, and hiking boots, clothing which was appropriate for hiking in the Asheville Mountains in the middle of April. The body had no wallet or ID but a blue vinyl backpack was found in Judy's possession. Inside was winter clothing and $80 in cash. Her shirt had been buried nearby, and it also had money in the pockets, $87. This $167 was consistent with the $200 Jeffrey suspected his wife had been carrying at the time of her disappearance. Given that Judy still wore her wedding band and the money was left untouched, authorities ruled out robbery as a motive in the case. The red backpack that Judy always traveled with was not found, and it has never been located, nor were the clothes that she was last seen in. Expensive sunglasses were found on the body, but the family did not recognize them as belonging to the 51-year-old. On the whole, the family were baffled by this turn of events. According to them, Judy had expressed no desire to travel to Asheville, she had only visited the city on two occasions, once when she was visiting Jeffrey, and the other when she was accompanying a patient when they went to see the family. A clerk from a nearby store then stepped forward, recalling the interaction they'd had with Judy months earlier in April. She had appeared alert and pleasant, and there didn't seem to be anything wrong. She had mentioned that she had an attorney husband from Boston who was attending a conference in Philadelphia, and that during that time, she had decided to visit Asheville. A further two people saw Judy, or a woman matching her description, in a grey sedan. The witness was a deli owner who claimed she'd bought $30 worth of sandwiches and a toy truck. The other was an employee at Baltimore Estate, and remembered that Judy had asked if she could spend the night in her car at the nearby campground. When she was told no, she drove off, and the employee noticed that her car was filled with boxes and bags. These sightings are considered credible by local investigators. Eventually, Jeffrey Smith was ruled out as a suspect in his wife's case by the Buncombe Sheriff's Department, but not by Philadelphia PD. He died eight years later in 2005. It was believed that Jeffrey was too morbidly obese to have been able to take Judy's body up the hill where she had been found. He also had an alibi for the day she went missing, which was corroborated by several people. While a friend suggested that the couple had problems in their marriage, which may have led Judy to want some time away from her husband, Jeffrey, along with Judy's adult children, say this is not true and that the marriage was fine. There has been a multitude of different theories surrounding Judy's case. It was briefly speculated that Gary Michael Hilton may have been responsible for the murder. Dubbed the National Park serial killer, Hilton had murdered an elderly couple in October of 2007 in the Pisgah National Forest where Judy was found. He was later arrested and convicted of several crimes, but has never been positively linked with Judy's murder. Online sleuths have wondered if Judy planned to disappear and then met with foul play, but others have asked if she was so unhappy in her marriage, why did she go to Philadelphia at all? when she could have stayed home. It's also been postulated that Judy was suffering from early onset dementia, or maybe even disassociative fugue disorder, or that the body isn't Judy's at all. Others have suggested that the couple perhaps planned the disappearance together as some sort of insurance scam, but that something went terribly wrong. A detective with the Buncombe Sheriff's Department said he believed that Judy went to Asheville voluntarily and that she was killed where she was found as it would have been difficult to drag or move the body to that location. Other members of the police force believe Judy's killer is not native to North Carolina, but perhaps has ties there. Jeffrey mentioned that his wife was the type of person to stop and help someone else. Perhaps her killer lured her away 
by feigning injury or sickness. Although there is an abundance of theories in Judy's case, there are very few answers. As the years go by, her case grows colder and remains a mystery. Juana Barraza Born on December 27th, 1957, in Apazo, Yucan, in Hidalgo, Mexico, Juana Barraza did not have the kind and nurturing environment one would expect a parent to provide their child with. Several accounts claim that her mother was a sex worker, who birthed Juana at just 13 years of age, and who was an abusive alcoholic while her father was alleged to have fathered as many as 32 children. When Juana was 12 years old, her mother traded her to an older man for booze. It was at his hands that Juana suffered further trauma as he sexually abused her. By the age of 16, she had endured two miscarriages as a result of the ongoing abuse, and eventually she even birthed a son who later died at the age of 24 due to injuries he sustained in a mugging he'd been the victim of. Little else is known about Juana's early tragic life other than that she had a string of failed marriages that were often abusive and which gave her three more children, two daughters and another son. By all accounts, Juana supported her family via minimum wage jobs, petty theft and eventually home burglary and was known to be illiterate. Most notably, Juana was known to work as a popcorn vendor at wrestling events. She was noted to be a huge fan of Lucha Libre, a form of Mexican professional wrestling famous for its use of mask-wearing fighters. She was often seen frequenting the front rows of arenas and even organized local wrestling events for small town fiestas. She even attempted to craft her own career in wrestling, but was unsuccessful as Juana only ever participated in small amateur events. She went by the name of La Dama del Silencio, or the Lady of Silence, something which had stuck with her throughout her criminal career. When asked about why she chose this name, she told reporters, I am quiet and I keep myself to myself. But for many, the Lady of Silence moniker has a disturbing connection to her crimes. In 2003, Mexico City saw a rise in the number of grisly crimes against elderly women. Although the public and media alike noticed the troubling stats, Mexican authorities were quick to dismiss this fear as media sensationalism and so the cases continued to grow unchecked until 2005 when law enforcement finally began a thorough investigation into the crimes. The unidentified serial killer, dubbed Mata Vajitas, or the Little Old Lady Killer, was known to attack women over 60 years of age who lived alone. The victims were often strangled with things such as curtain cords, stockings, and telephone cables, although some were beaten Several news articles online thought that Juana sexually defiled her victims, but this is not widely reported. The killer was also known to take valuable possessions on occasion, but often instead took trophy-like religious objects such as Bibles and crucifixes. At one point, authorities thought that there were perhaps multiple killers involved and were thrown off by a red herring during the investigation when they discovered that several of the victims owned the same print of a painting from the 18th century. Thus, for a period of time, they were chasing down false leads. Mexican law enforcement agencies profiled that the killer was a man confused about his sexual identity and had likely been abused at the hands of his mother or grandmother, thus leading to the brutal nature of the crimes, which indicated a burning hatred for his victims. Authorities discerned the sexual identity crisis portion of that description from the fact that in November of 2005, witness statements emerged that described the killer as wearing women's clothing, but that the killer was large, short-haired, and a, quote, masculine-looking woman. This profile, teamed with the fact that authorities believed the killer was likely a transvestite male, perhaps because of their own prejudices against the idea of women being serial killers, led them to pulling in around 49 transvestite sex workers for questioning. This in turn caused much upset and outrage among the LGBTQ community and the media, with journalist Joe Tuckman of The Guardian describing the actions of law enforcement as ham-fisted. 
Then, two months later, authorities began to fingerprint unidentified bodies in the morgue, hoping it would lead to the identity of the serial killer who they believed had killed themselves. Strangely, authorities felt that if the killer was a woman, she would not have been able to shoulder the guilt of all the crimes she'd committed. Finally, in January of 2006, law enforcement made the breakthrough that they needed when a suspect was arrested fleeing the home of one of the latest victims. The victim was an 82-year-old woman who'd been strangled to death with a stethoscope. The elderly woman's lodger saw the killer leave just before stumbling over the deceased's body, and the suspect was detained by passing police and neighbours. It was a surprise to the media and the law enforcement when the killer turned out to be the mother of four, Juana Barraza, who was 48 years old at the time. With her conservative attire and neat, cropped hair, she resembled the composite images of the suspect and was found carrying pension forms, a stethoscope, and a fake social worker ID card. The nail in the coffin for Juana was when authorities searched her home and found newspaper clippings of her crimes, neatly stored away, as well as objects taken from the crime scenes. Juana had made her way into the homes of some of the most vulnerable people by posing as a government official and offering them sign-ups to welfare programs, whilst with others, she reportedly offered to do part-time work for them, such as cleaning and cooking. It was believed that Juana prowled neighborhoods looking for elderly women who lived alone. Upon being caught, Juana's fingerprints connected her to at least 10 other murders. Some sources report that she went on to confess to four, but most report that she only confessed to one, the murder of Ana Maria de los Reyes, the victim of the murder she committed just before being caught. She claimed she'd gotten angry at the elderly woman and that she lashed out due to the lingering resentment she had for her own mother, who died in 1980. Juana denied involvement in all other cases. Prosecutors attempted to charge her with 27 deaths, and during her trial in the spring of 2008, they alleged that she was responsible for as many as 40. Meanwhile, her defense argued that Juana was being used as a scapegoat to calm the media and local civilians, and argued that she was mentally unfit. This, however, fell through. On March 31st, 2008, Juana was found guilty of 16 charges of murder and aggravated burglary, and was sentenced to 759 years in prison. At the time of her arrest, Juana had her two youngest children living at home with her, one aged 13 and one aged 11. Both were sent to live with their older sister, who had married and left the house early on in life, but had stayed close to her mother. According to all sources, Juana had healthy, functioning relationships with her children, and they're described as being friendly and well-mannered. In prison, Juana married 74-year-old inmate Miguel Angel, who was serving a life sentence for murder. The pair had dated via mail, meeting for the first time on their wedding day. Reportedly, the couple saw each other three times afterwards, totaling just two hours. The marriage crumbled in less than a year. Juana is Mexico's first recorded female solo serial killer and will likely spend the rest of her days in prison. She will be technically eligible for parole in 2058, at which time she would be 100 years old. Estibalus Carranza Dubbed the Ice Cream Killer, or Ice Killer, Estibalus Carranza was born on September 6, 1978 in Mexico, though she holds dual nationality for Mexico and Spain. An intelligent honor student, Estibalas moved as a child to Spain and eventually moved herself to Germany, where she apparently learned the language within just three months. From there, the young woman moved to Austria, where she opened her own ice cream parlor establishment. It was here, in Vienna, at 22 years old, Estibalas married 38-year-old Holger Holtz following a short courtship. Estibalaz seemed to be fixated on settling down and starting a family of her own, but her fairy tale ending didn't come as she hoped. The relationship between her and her husband quickly disintegrated. Once the pair was married, Holger began to verbally abuse his wife and was described as lazy and uninterested in her. He quickly stopped sleeping with her and repeatedly told her that she was unattractive. 
Holger also became part of the Hare Krishna movement and apparently began spending the bulk of his time at a temple rather than at home with his wife. Disheartened with her marriage and eager to have a child, Estibulus decided to take up a relationship with an ice cream machinery salesman named Manfred Hinterberger, who was 48 years old at the time. She divorced from her husband, but he refused to move out. So, when the relationship between Estibulus and Manfred started to collapse, her ex had a front row seat to the show. Reportedly, in 2008, when Manfred left Estibulus for another woman, her ex-husband took delight in this and told her that she'd never find another man. Holger was sitting at his computer desk when Estibulus walked up behind him and shot him dead with his own handgun. She shot him twice, then a third time, just to be sure. According to her own memoirs, which were published in 2014, Estibulus then tried to burn the body, but it remained mostly intact. The fire got so heated that the local fire brigade turned up at her door, but she managed to turn them away without being caught. Fearing being found out and having her chances at motherhood quashed, the then 30-year-old decided to purchase a chainsaw and spent time dismembering her ex-husband's body. She concealed his remains in empty ice cream pails from her store, which she then filled with concrete and stashed in the cellar of her shop. The disappearance of Holger Holz went unnoticed and Estibulus carried on with her life as if nothing had happened, still desperately seeking a man who would do right by her and the children she wanted. Shortly after this, Manfred Hinterberger appeared back on the scene. This time he came prepared with all the right things to say, begging Estibulus to take him back and promising that he was ready to settle down and start a family. So, the young woman agreed to rekindle their romance, but she found herself struggling to trust her new partner. In 2010, Estibulus found nude photos and sexual texts from a woman on Manfred's phone, which spurred her into taking shooting lessons as well as researching concrete mixing. One night, the couple engaged in a heated argument about Manfred's inability to be faithful, but instead of resolving the argument, Manfred simply turned away from her in bed and fell asleep. Blinded by rage and likely desperation, Estibulus shot her boyfriend to death. This time, however, she was prepared with plastic sheets set up for when she disposed of the body in the same way she had her previous husband. When curious neighbors asked what she was up to, the then 32-year-old woman simply told them it was a new ice cream machine in the parlor. Once more, Estibulus' life returned to normal until 2011, when maintenance workers who were carrying out tasks in the cellar of her ice cream parlor noticed a foul smell wafting about the room. Although she had done her best to cover up the stench of decaying flesh with an abundance of air fresheners, Estibulus couldn't quite eradicate it. One of the basement workers opened up one of the pails in the freezer and was shocked and traumatized when he found the rotting remains of a leg inside. Estibulus wasted no time. She fled to Italy via taxi ride and was located in the apartment of a street musician who had possibly just dodged a bullet when Estibulus was arrested. On the same day of her arrest, Estibulus found that she had gotten the one thing she always wanted. She was pregnant. The father is named only as Roland in newspaper articles, and the circumstances of their relationship are unknown. At her trial, Estibulus was defended by Rudolf Mayer, the same lawyer who defended the monstrous Joseph Fritzl. Prosecutors described Estibulus as singularly cold-blooded, while a psychiatrist diagnosed her as having a personality disorder and labeled her as extremely dangerous and capable of killing again. Professionals were uncertain that therapy would really benefit her. Despite this, in 2017, Estibulus was moved from her prison to a special center in Aston, near Linz City in Austria. The facility is mixed sex, state of the art, and gives prison inmates the freedom to move within the center and cook together. She was reportedly moved for showing an advanced reduction in the relevant dangerousness. Details on how the 40-year-old showed improvements and how she went from being at risk of relapsing to being suitable for a transfer to a less restricted environment is unknown. In 2014, Estibulus published a book on the events that transpired between 2008 and 2011, and has spent her time behind bars studying business. According to some reports, the proceeds from her book are going straight to her son, who she had in prison, and who is also named Roland after the father. One BBC article notes that she married the father of her child while in prison, 
and there are mixed reports about whether the son lives with his father or his grandparents in Spain. Bell Gunnus. Berenhild Storseth, better known as Bell Gunnus, was born on November 11th, 1858 in Selbu, Norway. She grew up in a poor family who were tenants on a small farm and her early life in poverty is what fueled her later greed for wealth and the good life during adulthood. Bell was in her early 20s when she moved to the United States in 1881. She spent some time working as a maid in Chicago where she changed her name to Belle Peterson before settling down with another Norwegian immigrant named Mads Sorensen in 1884. The couple owned a sweet shop that at one point fell victim to arson, burning down completely, but it gave the pair a handsome insurance payout. Mysteriously, their home also burned down and again, the Sorensons received money from this. Although they were likely happy with the money they received, to the outside world, it looked as if tragedy constantly followed Belle wherever she went. The couple had two children, although they were not biologically Belle's own. The first, Caroline, died in 1896, and her brother, Alex, followed her two years later in 1898. Both passed away from colitis, although it is now believed their illnesses were brought on by poisoning from their new mother. Further upset came when, on July the 30th, 1890, Mads died of cerebral hemorrhaging. According to his wife, Mads came home with a headache, so Belle gave him quinine powder for the pain. When she went to check on him later in the day, she found him dead. Looking back, it feels awfully coincidental that Mads tragically passed away on the only day that his two life insurance policies overlapped. One began while the other was about to expire, but to authorities at the time, there was no malicious intent to be found, and Belle was cleared of any involvement in her husband's end. She collected $5,000, over $140,000 in today's money from his life insurance policies and moved to a farm in Indiana. In 1902, Bell married Peter Gunnis, a recent widow himself with two young children to take care of, the youngest of whom passed away just seven months old and only a week into the couple's marriage. Peter was also from Norway and in another tragic or suspicious turn of events, died after eight months of marriage to his new wife. According to Bell, Peter reached up for something on a high shelf and was hit by a meat grinder that fell on him. His cause of death was an injury to the skull and his grim passing was ruled as accidental. Things were largely quiet for Bell for several years after that until April 28, 1908, when her farmhand, a man named Joe Maxson, awoke to find the home up in flames, with thick smoke billowing from the raging fire. He attempted to wake the children and Belle herself, but the doors to their rooms were locked, and so he fled to alert the local fire brigade. Once the fire was extinguished, the local community was saddened that the headless body of a woman, presumed to be the 48-year-old Belle Gunnis, was found along with the bodies of her three foster children. Newspapers wrote of the ultimate tragedy, that the woman who'd gone through and lost so much in her lifetime had met a horrifying end trying to save her children from the flames. It was later found that all three children had a form of poison in their bodies that was often used by their mother, but the testifying doctor refused to declare it was the official cause of death. Around this time, local police were contacted by a man named Asle Helgelian, who'd found out about the fire. His brother, Andrew, had been corresponding with Belle for quite some time before he went missing when he ventured out to visit her in person. In their letters, Belle had sent approximately 80 over the course of 16 months. Belle had asked that Andrew come stay with her, bring all his money with him, and tell nobody where he was going. Andrew told his brother he'd be back in a week, but he never came home. Although Asle had written to ask about his brother, Belle told him that Andrew had simply vanished and that she too would like to locate him. Asle, however, did not trust what she had said. It wasn't like his brother to take off and vanish without saying a word to anyone. When he had heard about the fire on the farm, he had feared the worst. Asle came to see the scene of the blaze for himself. The farmhouse had been obliterated. What was left was blackened and charred. 
While investigating some dirt in the pigsty, however, he noticed some depressions in the mud, where, according to the farmhand, Bell had supposedly been depositing rubbish beneath the soil. Following a hunch, Asle dug up the earth, revealing a sack that contained human remains. Two hands, two feet, and a head were inside. They belonged to Andrew. Around the farm, there were dozens more depressions that hid sacks of human bodies, torsos, hands, arms, bones. The depressions were makeshift graves. The entire farm was a graveyard to dozens of bodies, each of which had been dismembered the same way, with the arms removed at the shoulders, the legs butchered at the knees, and the skulls showing gashes and blunt force trauma. Authorities on the scene lost count of the number of bodies they uncovered at the site of the fire. Despite the extensive media coverage that the remains attracted, the majority of the bodies still go unidentified to this day. One of the confirmed bodies was that of Jenny Olsen, Bell's teenage foster child. In late 1906, Bell had told neighbors that Jenny was off at university, which is why she hadn't been seen in a while. More recently, shortly before the fire, she had explained that Jenny was off on her wedding trip. Reportedly, many of the bodies found on the farm were Belle's step and foster children. She is not believed to have had any biological children in her lifetime. The bodies on the discovery of the farm led to local law enforcement and the media alike reassessing Belle's character. No longer was she a devoted mother who'd simply been dealt a poor hand in life. Now, she was a serial killer covering up her grisly crimes in the most gruesome fashion imaginable. While it has often been said that 40 bodies were found, modern researchers estimate that in actuality, it was between 10 and 14 bodies that were found, possibly even more. In November of 1908, Ray Lamphere, Bell's 38-year-old former farmhand and on-again, off-again lover, was convicted of arson in connection with the farm fire. A heavy drinker and gambler, Ray had been hired by Bell in August of 1907. His defense at the trial claimed that Bell was still alive. Ray reportedly later told law enforcement that Bell would put up adverts in Norwegian papers seeking male companionship only to rob and kill the men who responded and visited her farm. Apparently, she even asked him to set fire to the house with the children inside and explained that she had faked her own death. Bell had gotten frightened by the idea of Asley coming to look for his brother, and so she had put a plan into motion. However, the couple had recently feuded. In the six weeks prior to the fire, Bell had issued four legal actions against her former farmhand. Ray was found guilty on two counts of trespassing, but Bell failed to have him declared insane or to get a peace bond to protect herself and her property. It's been theorized by online sleuths that Ray and Bell were partners in crime, carrying out the scheme together, but that Ray had grown jealous of Andrew and everything had spiraled out of control afterwards. Many believe that Bell considered Ray to be too poor to be an adequate suitor for herself. While there are some who believe that Bell died in the fire that day along with her foster children, many believe that she successfully faked her own death and lived out the rest of her days in another state, avoiding police detection. Much of this idea comes from the fact that, although Bell's scheme earned her the modern day equivalent to tens of thousands of dollars per kill, there was only $700 left in her bank account following the fire. It's also been reported that on the 27th of April, 1908, the day before the fire, Bell kept her children home from school and bought kerosene. Not only this, but she apparently also visited her lawyer to have her will written up and told anyone who would listen, she was afraid that Ray would kill her and burn her house down. Also, neighbors and locals at the time noted that the body in the fire seemed particularly small, too small to be that of Belle Gunnis, who was a tall, broad woman and weighed over 250 pounds. She was reportedly only identified on May 19th, 1908 by her dental bridges, which many have speculated she could have removed and thrown into the fire. There is little speculation about who the headless woman in the fire could be if it wasn't Belle but it has been postulated that perhaps it could have been a woman Bell had been seen with days earlier, or maybe a newly hired housekeeper. There have been many sightings over the years of Bell, although, of course, none have been verified. The most notable of these sightings is one which occurred in LA in 1931. 
Esther Carlson, 61, and Anna Erickson, 42, were set to be tried for the poisoning of Esther's employer, a wealthy 81-year-old man named August Lindstrom, for money that he kept in the house, which equaled about $33,735 in today's money. Esther was August's housekeeper and allegedly bore a strong resemblance to the presumed dead Bell Gunners. Due to their likeness and Esther's poisoning technique, many thought that this was the Belle Gunness, who'd faked her own death in 1908. Esther denied these accusations, citing her work record between 1890 and 1908 as proof. She passed away before the trial. After Esther's death, authorities arranged for some Indiana residents who knew Belle to visit the body. They believed it was her. Another resident identified the three children in a photo found in Esther's trunk as those who died in the fire. The only spanner in this argument is that Belle would have been in her early 70s, not her early 60s, in 1931. An Indiana lawyer who studied the case during her masters in anthropology believed Belle probably killed at least 25 people across her terrifying murderous career. Regardless of modern day theories, Belle Gunness was never conclusively tracked down, if she had truly fled in the first place. Ray Lamphere died a year into his prison sentencing, leaving authorities and locals with more questions than answers. Recent DNA tests have been performed on the body left in the fire, but due to the sample of Belle's DNA being too degraded as it came in the form of an envelope, the results have come back as inconclusive. Larry Groves. At around 11 p.m. on January 12th, 2003, 40-year-old Larry Groves, who lived alone but for his two dogs, was on the phone with his friend, Sandy Smith, from Mississippi. The pair were only 10 minutes into their nightly catch-up when someone on the other side of Larry's door began banging on it. A man was heard angrily shouting to be let in. Concerned, Smith asked Larry who it was. Larry said he would handle it and call her back in 20 minutes. But Larry never called back, and he was never heard from again. On January the 28th, Larry's mother Wanda filed a missing report on her son. She found out that nobody had heard from Larry in weeks, and that he had also not been attending to his successful antique business. Upon entering his house, authorities found no trace of the 40-year-old or his two dogs. The house was immaculate, with nothing taken nor out of place. This was confirmed by his mother, who went on to search the house for clues on Memorial Day weekend in May, and by his sister, Pam Spence, who also looked for details police might have overlooked in her brother's house that April. Then, on June 18th, roughly five months after Larry was last heard from, his neighbor, a man named Dick Shaliol, noticed that the peach tree in Larry's garden was starting to come far over the fence which separated their properties. The ripened fruit that fell to the ground was attracting bees that started to attack Shaliol's dog every time he let it outside. Mildly annoyed by this, he began cutting back the branches which hung over the fence. It was at this point that Shaliol noticed something disturbing. Great big bull flies covered the inside of a window in Larry's house. The exterior siding looked as though it had been painted black. He realized now that the crows that frequently gathered on the fence had been feasting on these bugs. Uncomfortable with what he was seeing, Shaliol immediately called Durl Bennett, the owner of the property. Durl was the father of Larry's partner, Tom, who had passed away from a heart attack in 2001. The two had been living together in the home since Larry was 17, after Durl had given the property to his son. Once Tom had passed away, however, ownership reverted back to Durl, who told Larry that he could continue to live in the bungalow for as long as he wanted. Inside, Shaliol and Bennett were hit with a foul odor. They thought it must have been the rotting meat in the fridge, but it wasn't. Durl and Bennett realized it was perhaps coming from the crawl space. Together, the men moved Larry's desk and pulled back the rug, revealing the trap door to the crawl space where they found the badly decomposed body of Larry Groves. His body had disintegrated so badly in the summer heat that a cause of death could not be determined. 
Larry's family, Wanda Groves and Pam Spence were sickened by the news, realizing they had both been right next to Larry when they'd been searching the home for clues. After speaking further with friends and family, Indiana State Police managed to discover the name of their first and only suspect in the case, the man who had turned up at the door on January 12th, 2003. On June 18th that same year, on the same day the body was found, police took this man in for questioning. Detective Don Curl, who worked on the case, described the suspect, who has never been publicly named, as being cold and calculated, never losing composure or rising to the bait. The interview ended with the suspect staying silent until his lawyer arrived, after telling police that he had already revealed everything he knew. An article from 2007 stated that police hadn't spoken with the man since this initial interview. In November of 2006, the FBI crime lab in Phoenix established that the hair and blood samples taken from Larry's body and crawl space did not conclusively match the man suspected of the murder, although one year later, Don Curl said there might be more evidence to test. In the months after Larry's initial disappearance, his other next door neighbor, Fred Holdman, claimed to have seen trucks coming and going at the home. However, he didn't think anything of it since Larry himself often drove a truck and loaded it up with antiques, so it was a common scene on the street. Law enforcement discovered from this information that the suspect they later questioned used the 40-year-old's truck to load up antiques and sell them to Michigan-based dealers. In the years following Larry's death, police seemed no closer to arresting his killer. To friends and family, it seemed obvious who was responsible, yet justice was out of reach. Larry was described by those who knew him as, quote, someone you either liked or you didn't, due to his frank nature and no-nonsense approach, but also as someone who was dependable and who would do anything for anyone. His partner, Tom Bennett, was about 10 years his senior and had taught Larry everything he knew about antiques. According to his friend, Sandy Smith, the couple had trouble being accepted in their town of Lakeville, Indiana. Larry was more effeminate and less confrontational than his partner, and so he took the brunt of the harassment. These statements from Sandy have made some online sleuths consider if Larry was the target of a hate crime. It has also been noted whoever killed Larry had to have known there was a crawl space beneath the house, something which even his mother and sister didn't seem to know existed. This line of speculation has led to some questioning the geniusness of Durl Bennett's character. It was clear he knew the trapdoor was there, so why did he not say anything sooner? Another theory that has been discussed online is the idea that the suspect had perhaps brought some muscle with him another person to do the dirty work. It's possible this person ambushed Larry when he opened the door, and maybe this would explain why the DNA found on the body did not match the police's primary suspects. Many have also questioned what happened to the dogs Larry owned, as they were never located. Dean Rauch, a reporter at the Lunar Echo newspaper in Lakeville, heavily criticized the local community for not caring about Larry's case or finding his killer blaming this on homophobia. He said, quote, There is no real public outrage. If this was an elderly woman or somebody's grandmother, somebody would be screaming about this murder. If it was an 11-year-old girl, there would be yellow ribbons all over still. But generally, no one cares. I think that's sad. To this day, almost 20 years after the murder, the case of Larry Groves is still unsolved. Leah Hickman Leah Hickman was a 21-year-old broadcast journalist student attending Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia. She had big ambitions to be a TV news reporter, and at the time of her disappearance, she was living with her half-sister, 25-year-old Jessica Vickers, in an apartment on 8th Avenue. Leah had attended Ohio Valley Christian School before graduating Christ Academy in Point Pleasant. She was fondly thought of by those who knew her, and she enjoyed TV shows such as Friends and Arrested Development, as well as spending time with her loved ones. 
Leah was last seen on December 14th, 2007 by her half-sister. That evening, Leah signed into her MySpace page, then called a friend to say she was going to McDonald's. The receipt for this was later found in her home. Jessica Vickers last spoke to Leah that night, when the 21-year-old had been washing dishes and told Jessica about her new university schedule and the grades she'd received for the semester. It seemed that Leah was extremely happy with her life and with how school was going. The next day, on December 15th, Jessica came home to find that Leah's keys, purse, and car were there, but the student herself wasn't. Her employer of five months, Dress Barn, reported that she had not turned up for work that day, something which was highly unlike her. With nobody able to reach her, the family began to worry. Ron Hickman, Leah's father, was hit especially hard by the disappearance of his daughter. Ron resided an hour away in Point Pleasant, but drove through with his sister and a preacher to search Leah's home. Leah was Ron's only child, and the pair were extremely close. On Monday, December 16th, 2007, a missing persons report was filed with the Huntington Police Department. Law enforcement and search parties canvassed the area while Dress Barn put up a $10,000 reward for any information that led to Leah's whereabouts. A week later on December 21st, just days before Christmas, Leah's body was found stuffed in the crawl space under her apartment building, her body wrapped in plastic. It was determined that she had been murdered, having died from strangulation. The apartment complex's crawl space could be accessed through the communal laundry room and via each of the four units in the building. Two of the units in the apartment were unoccupied, with Leah and her sister residing in the third. The fourth unit was occupied by a man who had a solid alibi confirming that he was out of town when Leah was killed. Early on, police had a suspect in the case, someone who was not publicly named. They stated they were trying to gather evidence so they could build a case against this unidentified person, believing this was not a random act of violence, but was carried out by someone familiar with the apartment block and Leah herself. Tips about Leah's murder flooded into the Huntington Police Department. Friends and family hung flyers around the city, appealing for information. The weekend before Christmas, Dress Barn closed its doors, hanging a sign that said they had closed out of respect for their former employee. They also covered the costs of Leah's funeral. Trace evidence found at the scene was sent to Phoenix, Arizona for DNA testing in 2008, and in 2009, the results came back, but they yielded no answers. Around this time, police said they still had some evidence and planned to use it when technology advanced further, hoping that one day it would lead to answers for Leah's family. Over the years, many members of the police department have assured the public and the family of Leah that her case is not cold and has not been closed, but it seems clear that progress has slowed considerably. Many online sleuths have criticized the investigation and expressed dissatisfaction with the police work showcased by Huntington PD. There is much speculation, both online and among the local community, that Jessica's ex-boyfriend was responsible for the murder, as he blamed Leah for the fact that Jessica had broken up with him. Allegedly, he and Leah had never got on. There are also many rumors floating around about Jessica helping this man to cover up the crime and that the plastic wrapped around Leah was from either Jessica's work or the ex-boyfriend's work. None of these postulations has any evidence to back them, however, and appear to be simple speculation. For the years after her murder, Leah's father continued to meet up with Lieutenant John Williams once a month for updates on the case. Even though Williams has now retired, he and Ron continued to keep in touch. In an article from 2019, Ron Hickman told of how his daughter left impressions on people. He said that even in recent years, he still has people approaching him to tell him how helpful Leah had been when she was alive. In one interview with NBC News, he said, quote, she left such an impression on people in such a short amount of time. Imagine if she had gotten to live her whole life. But despite an ongoing police investigation, the murder of Leah Hickman remains unsolved. 
The Whitehall Mystery One of the most striking and unusual cases of the 19th century, the Whitehall Mystery begins on September 11th, 1888, when a right arm and shoulder are found on the muddy shore of the River Thames. It was initially suspected that the arm had been placed in the water by a medical student as a prank, but in the following months, it became clear that something much more sinister was occurring in London. Dubbed the Whitehall Mystery, the case of pieces of a dismembered woman's body showing up around the city shook the British public in the late 1800s. It is now connected with the Thames Torso Murders, and, like those, remains unsolved. On October 2nd, less than a month after the arm was found on the banks of the River Thames, another body part was found. Men working on the construction of Scotland Yard found a parcel that contained human remains. The woman's torso had been found in a three-month-old vault that made up part of the cellar. It had been carefully wrapped in cloth, possibly a black petticoat, and neatly tied with string. Despite the effort put into packaging up the torso, it was clear that whoever had dismembered the body was not skilled in doing so. The body appeared healthy and well-nourished, and was matched by a police surgeon to the arm found the previous month. It was believed that the torso had been placed there after September 29th, as that was the most recent day that workers had been there in the cellar. The discovery of the arm, followed so closely by the finding of the torso, led to the brewing of panic among the locals, and fears that the killer would never be caught. Two weeks later, on October 17th, a reporter, utilising a trained dog and acquiring the help of a labourer, found a left leg which had been cut above the knee and buried near the construction site. The remaining limbs and the victim's head have never been located, even though it's been over a century since her remains were first discovered. She has also never been identified in the years since. In the aftermath of these grisly discoveries, police ruled out any connection between the dismembered Jane Doe and the serial killer, Jack the Ripper. Westminster's coroner initiated the inquest into Jane Doe's case. She was found to be, quote, of large stature and well-nourished, and approximately 24 years of age. It was noted that her uterus had been removed, and that her right arm had been removed by someone with anatomical knowledge post-mortem. The victim had been wearing a branch satin dress at the time of her death. This specific piece of clothing had been manufactured in Bradford, and the pattern was three years old. Some newspaper pieces found within the torso came from the Echo, dated August 24th, and from the Chronicle, although the date of this particular paper is unknown. Jane Doe's cause of death could not be established, although she is believed to have not suffocated or drowned. She is estimated to have been dead for around six weeks to two months. She appeared to have been a relatively healthy individual, and there was no indication that she had given birth in her short lifetime. Jane Doe is described as a fair-skinned individual with dark hair, and as someone who is not used to manual labour. There have been a few possible identities for Jane, though none that we can state with any degree of certainty. She was initially thought to have been a young, married woman who left her Lewisham home on August 20th, 1888. The unnamed woman was 23 years old and tall, and had threatened to take her own life. It is believed that this woman did commit suicide, and is likely not Jane Doe. Another possibility is that Jane was a woman named Emma Potter. In September of 1888, her mother had come forward fearing the body was that of Emma, who was 17 years old and of, quote, weak intellect. The young woman had one day left her home and simply never returned. The police surgeon confirmed that the particulars the mother gave of the girl matched those of Jane Doe's arm, but this lead has ultimately never been proven or disproven. In one of the more grisly cold cases of the 1800s, both Jane Doe and her killer remain unidentified. Lou Ann Cox 
Before the 1990s, Lou Ann Cox was described as a hard worker who took care of herself and kept her house clean. She was also noted to be a collector of Pepsi memorabilia, and friends and family characterized her as someone who was, quote, pleasant, friendly, and always tried to help people. But Lou Ann's life began to spiral out of control when her marriage ended in the late 80s, and those around her began to notice a dramatic shift in her behavior. With her marriage over and her divorce underway, Lou Ann started to sell all of her belongings and use the money to purchase drugs. Looking back on it, her mother, Mary Oxley, believed this lifestyle began when her daughter was injured in a serious traffic accident and started taking heavy pain medication. From here, she thought the addiction grew. Lou Ann would repeatedly ask her mother for cash, usually borrowing $20 each time, but Mary worried that the money she handed over was going straight to drugs, so she set about buying the items that Lou Ann needed, be it gas or food. In 1995, just one year before she was found dead, Luan was arrested for possession of cocaine. At this point, her father was in the final stages of terminal illness, which only served to exacerbate his daughter's drug addiction. Family described her as turning up at the hospital in poor physical condition and a changed demeanor, recalling how she would arrive with black eyes, appearing beaten up and strung out. This substance abuse that Lou Ann struggled with was just the beginning of her deterioration, however. The worst was yet to come. On March 9th, 1996, at 11.30 a.m., a worker at the Prairie Creek Lake in Indiana noticed something in the weeds near the motorbike trails at the southwest end of the reservoir. Initially believing someone had just carelessly dumped trash of some sort, the worker went to investigate and was horrified to discover the nude body of a woman wrapped in two blankets. When authorities arrived on the scene, they found that the victim had been badly beaten and strangled with either a thin rope or a wire, and had been dead for around six to eight hours. She had been sexually assaulted, although there was no DNA evidence to collect from her body. It didn't take long for her to be identified by the Pepsi tattoo on her left ankle as 42-year-old Lou Ann Cox. Just two days after Lou Ann's body was found, the staff at the Mabel's Motel called authorities to tell them that she had recently stayed at their establishment. The motel was made up of a series of log cabins available for overnight lodgings. Reportedly, the alert staff at the motel had noticed Lou Ann's image in the paper, so they had reached out to law enforcement. A room cleaner had discovered several blankets missing from one of the cabins, and then uncovered a blood stain on the mattress. These findings were located in the cabin adjacent to the one Lou Ann had rented. According to staff, the 42-year-old had checked into the motel early on Friday, turning in her room key that evening. However, she appeared again at the front desk at 3.30 on Saturday morning, eight hours before her body was found, and asked for the key to the same cabin. When staff turned her away, they noticed her walk off into the darkness, in the direction of the cabin. However, this lead was not as useful to investigators as they might have hoped, since by the time they arrived on the scene, it had already been cleaned away by the hotel maids. Later DNA tests showed that it was Lou Ann's blood on the mattress, but the DNA of the murderer, or anyone else who might have been present at the time, was not recovered. Within days, police located and took in for questioning the man who had rented the adjacent cabin where the blood was found. The man, unnamed in articles pertaining to Lou Ann's murder, had arrived on Friday and left around 10 a.m. on the morning of Saturday the 9th of March. This unidentified man admitted to knowing Lou Ann and also agreed that he had stayed in the cabins at the same time as she. However, the questioning ended when the man demanded to consult with an attorney. His car was searched in connection with the investigation, but this turned up no new leads for authorities. He was never arrested or charged in relation to the murder and passed away from cancer in 2004. Law enforcement soon discovered that Lou Ann had visited several taverns on the south and east sides of town on the night of March 8th. She ended up in the Village Inn, 221 East Jackson Street, by 1.30 a.m. 
According to witnesses, it was here that Luan had an unpleasant and angry exchange with an unidentified man. This stranger is separate from the one brought in for questioning and is described as being five foot nine, slim, white, and in his early 30s, with shoulder length brown hair and wearing a leather coat and cowboy boots. Luan's niece, Tara, who was interviewed for an article by the Star Press in 2014, described how a cousin had taken her to that scene years later. According to Tara, this cousin seemed to know a lot of details about the people Lu An hung out with and said that on that night, Lu An had smacked the man she was having the heated exchange with and he had responded by telling her, quote, she would get hers later. It's unknown if the cousin witnessed the altercation or learned about it later and whether or not they spoke to authorities regarding this information. While police received two tips concerning the identity of this stranger from the tavern, no link was ever found between either of these men and Lu An, although it is noted that one of the men had a history of battery arrests. For a time, Lu An's case was linked to that of 27-year-old Kim Weatherspoons, who was murdered in February of 1996. At one time, the pair had lived within just one block of each other, and both had been sexually assaulted and strangled. They were also both connected by prostitution and drug charges. In later years, the link between the two was ruled out. Since then, Luan's case has grown cold. It received some brief spotlight in 2014, when Ball State University had criminal justice and criminology students working on a handful of cold cases with law enforcement. However, nothing new came from this further investigation. Luan's mother, Mary Oxley, passed away in 2014, having never seen justice for her daughter's brutal murder. Before that, both she and her niece Tara voiced their concerns that the police weren't taking the case seriously and that they felt unsatisfied with the investigation. Luan was laid to rest in the Elm Ridge Cemetery, not far from the grave of her father. To this day, her case remains unsolved. The Hill Axe Murders of Ardenwald In the spring of 1911, 33-year-old William Hill, his wife, 33-year-old Ruth, and her two children from a previous marriage, Philip, who was eight, and Dorothy, who was four, moved into a cabin with two rooms, one for sleeping and one for living and dining with a kitchen attached. The cabin was located in rural Ardenwald, a neighborhood in Portland, Oregon. By all accounts, the Hill family was well liked and just like any other family in the area. William, a pipe fitter for Portland Gas Company, was described as a hard worker who kept to himself, while Ruth, who had divorced her previous husband on the account of him being a drunk, was a former society girl whose brother and farmer were prominent Portland lawyers. Reportedly, on June 8th, Ruth went to consult with her father and was, quote, disturbed about something. But it's unknown what exactly this conversation was about. Other than this scrap of information, there is nothing in the family's movements prior to their murders that could indicate that there was anything wrong. On June 9th at 8 a.m., Sarah Matthews, the wife of C.W. Matthews, who lived next door, approached the door of the hills. She knocked, noticing the unusual quietness about the cabin. Sarah's husband had pointed out to her earlier that morning that he had not seen William leave the property to catch the interurban streetcar that took him to his job. This was most unusual. As Sarah waited for a response from her neighbors, she noted that all the windows in the cabin had been uncharacteristically covered with cloth. When a response didn't come from the hills, Sarah peeked in through a gap in the window and was alarmed to see a four-year-old Dorothy's bloodied body lying on the floor. The county sheriff, Ernest Mass, was quick to arrive on the scene after Sarah and CW reported the crime to local authorities. Inside, the house was a bloodbath. At first, police couldn't find William's body, but they soon discovered it under Ruth's. It had been extremely well concealed. The pair were found entangled in bed. Ruth had been struck with an ax twice, while William had been bludgeoned. The children were killed next also with the ax. It was determined that the family had been killed around 12.45 a.m., indicated by a broken clock in the cabin. 
A neighbour also reported that his dog began barking around this time. There are mixed reports on whether Dorothy alone was sexually assaulted or whether both she and her mother were. Regardless, the crimes were excessively violent, with each family member suffering massive trauma to their faces and skulls. Bloody fingerprints were found on Dorothy and on Philip's arm, but this did not lead authorities to a suspect. The axe used in the murders had been left in the home, propped up at the end of Dorothy's bed. It did not belong to the Hill family, and the scent dogs tracked it back to the front porch of a man named Joseph Delk, three quarters of a mile away. Bloodhounds were used at the crime scene to help find further clues, but they unfortunately turned up nothing. Law enforcement was quick to narrow down motives. Although some jewelry was missing from the cabin, other cash and valuables were left untouched, excluding robbery as a motive. It was believed that sex was the motive behind the gruesome crime, and that possibly a paedophile was responsible. There were several suspects in the case of the Hill family murders. Edward Ramsey, a vagrant who lived in the woods, trapping animals and stealing food, was the first person authorities took note of when they began to investigate, as it was believed that he had been the subject of complaints in the neighbourhood about a man lurking in the area. However, Ramsey was later cleared of any involvement in the murders. In May of 1917, a man named William Riggin admitted to shooting another man in October of 1915 and during this, he claimed to have witnessed the Hill family murders. Regan said that he met William Flynn, an alias of the vagrant Edward Ramsey, and a Mexican man who went by the nickname Brown in Oregon City, where they hatched a plan to rob local homes. According to Regan, he waited outside the Hill's cabin for 30 minutes, during which he heard children screaming inside. Without further questioning, however, Regan's story began to transform. He changed his tale, stating that he actually participated in the robbery and the murders with Ed Ramsey, not with Brown and William Flynn. The two accounts that Riggin gave to authorities were riddled with inconsistencies regarding the cabin itself, plus other important details. It was later decided that these confessions could not be considered credible, as William Riggin was deemed to be mentally incompetent. The third and final suspect in the case of the Hill family murders was a man named Nathan Harvey, who was originally charged with the four murders in December of 1911. Harvey was a 55-year-old nursery owner who had been in a land boundary dispute with William and was also someone with loose connections to various crimes. In 1984, an 18-year-old woman was found murdered in a strawberry patch on Harvey's property. Later, one of his brothers shot their mother then drowned himself. As police questioned neighbours of his, several women claimed that Harvey had made, quote, improper proposals to them and also insulted them. When Harvey was arrested, Sheriff Mass stated that he had absolute proof that the 55-year-old had taken the last train to Ardenwald on the Interurban Railway, which arrived in the neighbourhood at around 12.25am on the night of June 9th. Two witnesses came forward beforehand to say that they had seen the man in question exit the train at that time on that date. Around the arrest of the nursery owner, there was much support from locals, but also those who believed Harvey was innocent. An anonymous landholder told the Oregonian newspaper that Harvey was, quote, feared. However, despite the evidence and theories surrounding Harvey's connection to the case, the charges against him were ultimately dropped just a week after his arrest, pending further investigation. In February of 1912, a judge formally closed further investigation into Harvey. Even with the charges dropped and the investigation closed, Ruth's brother and father continued to believe that Nathan Harvey was responsible for the murder of Ruth and her family. Allegedly, Ruth's brother went to visit Harvey at his nursery office and, quote, the gun just went off. No charges were ever brought against the brother for this accidental shooting. Many online sleuths have pointed out that Harvey's son, Corwin, who was 17 at the time of the murders, went on to have issues with statutory rape and paedophilia, even serving several sentences in prison. He reportedly had a preference for boys. It's been speculated that perhaps Corwin was his father's first victim, or that even Corwin was responsible 
and his father covered it up or helped him one way or another. Outside of the theories in relation to Nathan Harvey, it's widely thought that the Hill axe murders of Ardenwald are connected to several other axe murders from around this time. However, over a century later, it's likely we will never know for sure what truly happened in the case of the Hill axe murders of Ardenwald. Catherine Namath. On October 12th, 2002, 43-year-old Catherine Namath stopped by her parents' cabin at Loon Lake, Wisconsin, to get some food from the freezer. Catherine was the only one present, as her parents had left earlier that day to head down south for the winter months. Catherine, a medical technician and volunteer EMT in Elko, radioed from the cabin at around 7.12 p.m., saying, quote, This is 96. There's a man with a raincoat, and he's scruffy-looking and and then the radio went dead. Her husband, David, and their son, Nick, arrived at the cabin at around 7.44 p.m., 32 minutes after her final broadcast. David had tried but failed to contact his wife, and so took it upon himself to investigate what was going on. What he did not expect to find, however, was Catherine lying outside the cabin, having been attacked. She was still alive. David asked her who her attacker was, but the 43-year-old told him she didn't know. She passed away while being airlifted to the nearest hospital. Described as a kind, caring person, Catherine had spent October 12th running errands. According to her husband, David, Loon Lake was her favorite place. When authorities arrived, they took in the evidence right away. It was clear that Catherine had been chased through the property, trying to fight off her attacker. She had received multiple stab wounds during the struggle. DNA of the unknown assailant was recovered from the scene, but there has yet to be a match. Police launched into an extensive investigation, canvassing the area and interviewing friends and family. Eventually, their inquiry into Catherine's murder led them to wonder if the case was linked with another, that in which Catherine and her husband had been involved. David Namath was the fire chief of the Elko Fire Department, and he was currently being investigated alongside Catherine for embezzlement. Both husband and wife were being looked into, and the fire department's office records had been impounded as evidence. When Catherine found out about the investigation, she called the sheriff's department and stated that she wanted to come in and give full disclosure on some of the details. It soon appeared suspect to police when, two days before she was due to visit law enforcement and give information, she turned up dead. Eventually, David pleaded no contest to theft, disorderly conduct, and obstructing an officer in the case. While police continued to have their suspicions about Catherine and her link to the investigation, no connection has ever been found. Once the embezzlement case was closed, law enforcement found that they were no closer to catching the 43-year-old's killer. David, for his part, claimed to not know who killed his wife. Police tried to garner more information using what they call a John Doe hearing. A John Doe hearing is used for investigations which are thwarted or impeded and can be used to force witnesses to testify in a secret hearing. This helps law enforcement get information from people who may not be willing to come forward. Two men who knew David attended one of these John Doe hearings, but authorities believed they were not telling the truth. One of the men was later charged and convicted of a false swearing. The two men were friends of Matthew Becker, a fire department employee who had initially confessed to the embezzlement. Reportedly, these two men also had a thorough knowledge of the Elko area, having spent time there hunting. In 2007, 24 people were DNA tested. This was then compared to evidence which was found at the crime scene, but the attempt to find answers in Catherine's case was in vain. Another article from 2008 claims that a man declaring to have information on the murder died before he could be interviewed. The man, unnamed, passed away from natural causes, age 42. His meeting had been scheduled for February 22nd, and on February 21st, police entered his home in Pittsville, seizing a PC, among other things. This seemed to garner no new information, however. Due to his sudden passing, it's unknown what connection this man had to the case, if any at all. 
According to police in 2012, they did have a theory as to why Catherine was murdered, but they didn't have enough evidence to bring charges, and so they kept the theory under wraps until they did. However, that day has yet to come. Perhaps there is hope for the future, but as of 2020, the case of Catherine Namath remains unsolved. Jalik Rainwalker. Jalik Rainwalker was born on August 2nd, 1995, to a mother who was, sadly, addicted to crack cocaine and alcohol. As is not uncommon in such situations, Jalik too was born addicted to cocaine. With his mother unable to look after him, Jalik spent his early childhood in different foster homes before he was finally adopted in 2007 by Jocelyn McDonald and Stephen Kerr, who already had three biological sons and an adopted daughter. Understandably, Jalik was a difficult child, and despite being very intelligent, he was also very troubled and prone to violent temper tantrums. Although Kerr and McDonald were deemed a therapeutic home, supposedly suited to his special needs. However, they led a very unusual lifestyle at their home in Washington County, New York. It had no running water, the toilets were outhouses, the electricity came from a generator, everyone slept in one room, and all the children were homeschooled. The family stated they lived this way because it was better for the environment. Soon after his adoption, Jalik became problematic to the family, and his four siblings were allegedly scared of him. And according to his adopted father, Jalik threatened to rape a child at the small home school he attended. So, just three months after he was adopted, Kerr and McDonald called a crisis hotline and told them Jalik was unmanageable. McDonald said she was afraid of him, he was a danger to the family, and she no longer wanted him to stay in their home. She even asked to reverse the adoption. The crisis worker told her that this was not possible as the adoption was binding, so instead, she suggested respite care. Jalik was sent to the home of Elaine and Tom Person. They had provided respite care for Jalik in the past, so he was already familiar with them. Jalik stayed with the Persons until the 1st of November 2007, when he returned to Kerr, who planned to send him to another respite home the next day. Sadly, Jalik never made that trip. On the night of the 1st of November, Jalik spent the night with Stephen Kerr at Kerr's father's house in Greenwich. The pair were alone in the house and had not returned to the family home as they wanted to protect the other children from his violent outbursts. Kerr claims he woke up the next morning at around 7.30 a.m. to find Jalik was missing. He left behind a note which read, Dear everybody, I'm sorry for everything. I won't be a bother anymore. Goodbye. Jalik. Twelve-year-old Jalik has never been seen or heard from since. Kerr waited 90 minutes before reporting his son missing, and at first claimed a duffel bag and his son's favourite toy animal were both missing. However, these items were later found in their garage. Jalik did not have any cash or credit cards with him when he vanished. An extensive search of the area turned up nothing, and within a few days, police announced they suspected foul play, since it was unlikely that a child of that age could survive on his own. He was classified as endangered missing, although the possibility that Jalik ran away or committed suicide was not ruled out. Suspicion immediately fell upon his adoptive parents, and although McDonald took a polygraph and passed, Kerr refused to take one. He said he had a medical condition, and therefore it was too unreliable. He was also not willing to give a DNA sample. The couple claimed that biracial Jalik always identified as black, and always felt more comfortable around African Americans, and they believed he had run away to live within an African American community, possibly Albany, where Jalik's half-brothers lived. However, there is absolutely no evidence of this, and police debunked the claim early on and declared Jalik's adopted father as a person of interest in his son's disappearance. 
Police extensively searched their home and the grandfather's home because they suspected Jalik might be buried there. Additionally, police, forest rangers, and the FBI combed the woods and waterways around the Washington County towns of Greenwich and Cambridge. They even searched the camping grounds where the family vacationed, but not a trace was found. Although Jalik had no contact with his birth family, there are still several people who genuinely miss him and continue to search for answers. These include some of his foster carers and his maternal adoptive grandmother, Barbara Reilly, who even set up a task force dedicated to finding her missing grandson. It seems the only ones who want to forget Jalik are his adoptive parents, Jocelyn and Stephen. Barbara believes that the letter Jalik left when he disappeared was part of an earlier school project and had been written weeks before he vanished. To this day, Barbara maintains that her son-in-law knows more and might have killed Jalik. She said his behavior over the years leads her to believe he is capable of hurting a child. Barbara is now estranged from her daughter and they are no longer on speaking terms. During the investigations, Jalik's adoptive father has repeatedly lied to police about his whereabouts the night Jalik disappeared. He claimed he slept through the night, but police found an image from a surveillance camera that captured a van very similar to his. However, Kerr denied their request to examine his van. They also analyzed Kerr's cell phone data, and it pinged in an area far away from his father's home, where he said he was staying with Jalik. But perhaps most suspicious of all is that Kerr was caught by several people tearing down missing person posters of his son. Kerr denied this, but admitted he asked store owners to remove them. However, multiple eyewitnesses swear they saw Kerr removing the signs. In January 2008, there was a surprising breakthrough. A letter was sent to the media and the family, claiming that Jalik was still alive and likely being held by someone. The letter reads, Jalik still alive, needed a foot soldier for this war on drugs. Picked him up RT40 post 30. He's okay, no fake. He says, ask his mama and papa, who are the macaroni family? My cat named Diamond? Why does Franti yell fire? Don't try to look we are not there. The letter did not have a return address, but was postmarked Westchester, New York. Police suspected that Kerr himself wrote the letter to divert police and throw them off his trail. But why would he do this? It is fair to say that Jocelyn McDonald and Stephen Kerr's behavior has been very unusual since their son disappeared, and they appeared to have no interest in joining the campaign to find him. In 2013, the adoptive parents were reinvestigated, and Jalik's case was reclassified as a homicide investigation. Although, we must point out, there is still not enough evidence to charge either of them with any crime. When Jalik disappeared, he was a growing preteen, around 5 foot 6 and 105 pounds, with afro-styled hair. Today, he would be a 25-year-old man. One key identifying feature is a slight speech impediment that causes him to pronounce the letter R as W. It is still possible Jalik is alive, although as the years pass, it sadly becomes less and less likely. However, his adoptive parents are to this day convinced he is alive and living with a family who, for unknown reasons, have kept him hidden. If anyone has any information on this case, please contact the Greenwich Village Police Department on 518-692-9332. Joan Risch. The disappearance of Joan Risch is one of the most peculiar missing person cases ever. And although it occurred nearly 60 years ago, it still remains a hotly debated topic with internet sleuths. Joan Risch was a 31-year-old mother who lived in Ridgefield, Connecticut with her husband Martin, daughter Lillian, age 4, and son David, age 2. Joan had suffered a somewhat tragic childhood after both her parents died in a suspicious fire in 1940, and before being adopted by her aunt and uncle, she was placed with foster parents, where Joan said her foster father sexually abused her. 
However, by 1961, Joan was happily married, and although she wasn't thought to have lots of friends, she was active in her community and was a member of the League of Women Voters, and was also known to be fiercely protective of her children. On October 24th, 1961, Martin left their home early to catch an 8am flight to New York City for a business trip. After he left, Joan woke the children and fed them breakfast. She then left her son with her neighbour, Barbara Barker, so that she could run a couple of errands. First, she took four-year-old Lillian to a dentist appointment, then went to the bank to cash a check, before going to the shop to pick up a few things. Joan and Lillian returned home at 11am and picked up David from Barbara. The milkman and the mailman who delivered to Joan's home that day said they didn't notice anything unusual, and the dry cleaner who picked up Martin's suits for cleaning from inside the home said the same. Everything seemed normal. Around noon, Joan made the children lunch, and then put David down in his crib for a nap. He would typically sleep at this time for a few hours. While David slept, Lillian played with the next door neighbor's boy, Douglas, while Joan did chores in the garden. A little before 2 p.m., Joan asked if Lillian could go with Douglas to his house to play, and told Barbara that she would be back shortly. The two children played in the backyard. 15 minutes later, Barbara looked out her kitchen window and saw Joan come out of her house in a trench coat. She said Joan looked dazed and was walking quickly, but she just assumed she was chasing after David. She later saw Joan walking back towards her house. At 3.40 p.m., Barbara sent Lillian back to her own house because she needed to run errands for herself. She returned home at 4.15 p.m., and that is when Lillian came out of her house saying, Mummy's gone, and the kitchen is covered in red paint. Barbara rushed into the house. She found David crying in his crib, but no sign of Joan, and the red paint Lillian said she saw was not paint. It was blood. Police arrived at 4.33 p.m., and Sergeant Mike McHugh arrived a few minutes later. There was blood on the floor and the walls, and the phone had been ripped off the wall and thrown into a garbage can. The table and chairs had been overturned. An address book found nearby was opened to the emergency numbers section. Sergeant Mike then noticed that the blood on the kitchen floor trailed all the way upstairs to David's bedroom and all the way back into the kitchen. The trail continued all outside and stopped at the trunk of Joan's car. The amount of blood found did not indicate Joan had suffered a life-threatening wound. It also appeared that someone had tried to smear the blood around to make it look like there was more blood than there really was. The blood type was O, which matched to Joan's, although it was never determined if it was in fact her blood. Investigators found it odd that with all the blood on the floor, there were no footprints in it. There was, however, a bloody partial palm print and two fingerprints on the wall and a single bloody thumbprint on the phone. At the time, it could not be determined if they were Joan's prints, as she had none on file, but it was later confirmed that they were not hers. To this day, there hasn't been a match. Initially, it was believed that she had committed suicide, but a thorough search of the area turned up nothing. The next door neighbor's daughters told police that they saw a two-toned Oldsmobile sedan parked behind Joan's own vehicle in her driveway around 3.20 p.m., the day she disappeared. Another neighbor claimed they saw a smaller car parked along the street, and the milkman said he also saw that vehicle parked in Joan's driveway five days earlier when he delivered their morning milk. There were several people who claimed to see Joan the day she went missing. Many reported they saw her walking along Route 128 in Walton, which was close to the Cambridge Reservoir. Investigators took these tips seriously and had the water searched thoroughly, but nothing was found. Another report was that she was walking along the side of Route 2A, which was close to her home, wearing a loose-fitting grey coat and a handkerchief tied underneath her chin like she was trying to hide her face. She was described as, quote, shuffling along and hunched over, clutching her stomach, and had what looked like blood or mud on her legs. In a strange twist, investigations revealed that leading up to her disappearance, Joan had checked out several books from her local library. All the books were about true crime and mystery. In fact, she had checked out a total of 25 books in the months leading up to her disappearance. However, one stood out. It was titled Into Thin Air, 
and was about the tale of a young wife who disappears from her home and the only evidence left behind was the blood that had been smeared with towels. In the book, the woman left her husband and newborn child to find a more fulfilling life. Could this have been what Joan did? No one knows for certain, there has never been a trace of Joan ever found, however, there are a lot of theories. Some believe that Joan had a botched abortion or maybe even a miscarriage and that's where all the blood came from and that is what the neighbor saw. The blood loss may have made Joan disoriented and she tried to walk to the hospital or get help and passed out and bled to death. Or the abortionist botched an operation, panicked when she stumbled out of the house and followed her, murdered her and disposed of her body to cover their tracks, making the house look like she'd had an intruder. It is, however, important to note that there is no evidence Joan was pregnant, and if she was, her husband was unaware. Others believe that the car that was frequently seen was that of her lover, and she left with him to start a new life. This one seems unlikely, as Joan lived for her children, and by all accounts was happily married, and it wouldn't have been in her nature to get involved with another man. The official line is that she was murdered by an intruder, and her body was transported possibly to the nearby town of Lexington, where she was buried in a vacant tract of land that years later became a residential housing estate. But despite of all these swirling theories and ideas, we are still no closer to truly knowing what happened in the case of Joan Rish. Charlie Allen Jr. 22 year old college senior Charlie Allen Jr. was an obsessive tennis player who dreamed of becoming a professional, but on October 12th, 2007, he vanished from the face of the earth. The day he went missing, he had played tennis with his friend Mason on Dartmouth campus, where he was a senior psychology major. After the game, the pair ate pizza at the student cafeteria, then parted ways, and was supposed to meet up again at 8pm that evening to go to a party. However, Charlie never showed up. What happened next is unclear, but it is known that Charlie's sister noticed that his Facebook had been deleted so she called him to ask why. He freaked out, telling her that he didn't do it and that important people were after him. He ended the call by telling her that all the answers can be found in the periodic table of elements. Charlie then calls his parents on their cell phones and leaves them voicemails, telling his dad he's going to Texas and his mum he's going to Florida. In the calls, it sounds like he's running. The last time Charlie was seen was around 3 a.m. in the early hours of October 13th, when he broke into a house near campus, wearing just his pants and trainers. When the homeowner confronted him, he asked her if Mason was there. When the woman said no, he apologized and ran away into the woods. He has never been seen or heard from since. His parents became concerned when they couldn't get hold of him by phone, and they alerted the police. Investigators searched his dorm and found that his computer had been wiped. The only thing that they find is a web search for the University of Texas. They find Charlie's backpack in a backyard along with his shoes. His blue 1999 Ford Expedition car was found abandoned on the university campus and it looked like it had been slept in. His keys, cell phone and charger were never located. An extensive search of the area turned up nothing. It was, however, established that a few things changed in Charlie's life in the months leading up to his disappearance. He had inexplicably stopped taking his medication to treat his bipolar disorder. In addition to this, he had legally changed his name to Neo Babson Maximus. The exact reason he did this is unknown, but it's thought he wanted a more unique name for when he became famous as a tennis player. In the days after his disappearance, a trucker said he saw a shirtless, shoeless man hitching a ride out of town with a truck. No further progress was made on Charlie's whereabouts until 2009, when a man named Stephen, who lived in New Bedford, a town near Dartmouth campus, reported that a man rang his doorbell at 4 a.m. He said that he looked disheveled and asked for directions back to SMU, an old acronym for Dartmouth. The man seemed afraid and Stephen asked him to wait while he called the police, but when he went back to the door, the man was gone. When this man was later shown pictures of Charlie, he swore that that was the man at his door. 
Many believe that Charlie may have gone into a manic state without his medication, although the family disagree with this theory. It is also likely that if Charlie had entered a manic state, he would have been recovered and easy to track. Another theory is that he lost his mind and memory somehow and simply wandered off with no idea who he was. However, those who knew him believe he went missing intentionally, claiming he was too smart for the wiped computer and web search to be merely accidental. Or maybe, as he claimed, important people really were after him. To date, there is no new information, but there is a Facebook group set up that gets updated to help raise awareness and try and find out what happened to Charlie, or Maximus as he's now known. Was this a man who intentionally disappeared? Was he leaving clues about what he intended to do? Or had he suffered a mental breakdown after stopping taking his medication? Investigators don't believe foul play is responsible, but they also have no idea where Charlie is. It is entirely possible that he is still alive, living happily somewhere with a new identity. We sincerely hope this is the case and that one day he feels he can come forward and reunite with his family. Justin Alexander Shetler. Justin Shetler was born in Florida and his interest in traveling, the outdoors and wilderness survival sparked when his mother withdrew him from regular high school, age 16, and sent him to Wilderness Awareness School near Seattle. It was here that Justin bonded with his instructor and the pair began to go on expeditions together. Afterwards, Justin began to teach at a children's camp associated with the school for a while. Upon finishing the school himself, he held multiple jobs and fronted a band who toured as far as Japan. In 2009, Justin joined a friend in Miami working for a tech startup company, allowing him to not only live a life of luxury, but to retire age 32 in 2013. From here, Justin sold most of his belongings and began traveling, documenting his experiences on his blog, Adventures of Justin. He spent two and a half years traveling South Africa, Asia, and the United States. Justin was 35 in 2016 when he visited India. He had grand plans to make the three day trek to a holy site called Mantalai Lake with a Hindu holy man around the end of August. He also intended in staying in a cave for weeks, emulating the life of the holy people. Four days prior, he had blogged about his schedule for the trip, saying, quote, I should return mid-September. If I'm not back by then, don't look for me. Friends and family described this blog post as distressing. It seemed like Justin was constantly pushing himself to do more and more. To reach the lake, Justin would need to travel through Parvati Valley, which has only one road in and one road out. The valley attracts tens of thousands of tourists a year, but has a rather bleak history. Since 1988, at least two dozen tourists have died or disappeared in and around the valley. Many families have suspected foul play by local drug mafias and holy people due to the fact that it is an isolated area with a lack of regulation when it comes to visitors. Few of these families ever receive answers. Justin was described as a seasoned traveler and an experienced outdoorsman with excellent wilderness survival skills, so it seemed unlikely that this trek would be any different to all of those he'd been on before. And it wasn't, not really. But once the 35-year-old returned from the valley, things took a turn. Justin was last seen on September 3rd, photographed returning from his trip after encountering some hikers he had met previously. The hikers told authorities that he hadn't eaten in two days, was severely underweight, and was exhausted. Reportedly, the holy man Justin had been traveling with had passed by them just 30 minutes prior. The group asked Justin to join them, but he declined, saying that he wanted to get back to his things and an internet connection so he could rest and then edit his latest video. After this point, Justin drops off the map entirely. When no one could reach him, the Indian authorities were contacted. The holy man Justin had traveled with, a man named Sadhu, was arrested and spent eight days in a prison cell. He was then found on October 21st, 2016, hanging by his loincloth when a guard returned from a toilet break. 
It's unknown if Sadu had killed himself due to the mistreatment he undoubtedly suffered from the guards, or whether he was murdered, or if he took his own life due to guilt he felt because he had something to do with Justin's disappearance. According to Outside Online, Sadu was not, by most accounts, an authentic holy man, and was described as being rough and crude. Justin had allegedly been warned to be careful when dealing with him. To add to this, upon hearing that he was missing, three Indian hikers came forward to claim that they'd seen Justin arguing with Sadhu. Justin had told them that he was tired and hungry and wanted to descend. Another article from Slate.com presents Sadhu in an even worse light, characterizing him as a criminal who sold his family and his home in Nepal to come to India. For his part, before the authorities were involved, Sadhu told his friends that Justin was crazy and had gone off without him. Police found that the last time Sadhu was seen with Justin, they had a porter along for the journey as well. The holy man told police that the porter had been sent up ahead as they traveled, and Justin had followed. Meanwhile, Sadhu had hung back due to his knees hurting. When he finally caught up with the porter, Justin was nowhere to be seen. The pair descended from the lake, opting not to inform the police. The porter repeated this story when he was interviewed by authorities. After Justin went missing, his mother, Susie, flew to India with a friend of Justin's, meeting with the US Embassy before traveling north to the mountains. Meanwhile, friends of his began searching on foot with a group of Indian trekking guides who knew the area well. A trail below the lake eventually led to the discovery of a bamboo flute staff, a black waterproof backpack, a grey scarf, and a red lighter, which had been given to Justin recently by a Russian man he'd befriended before setting off on his journey to the Parvati Valley. Indian authorities initially suspected that Justin had taken drugs and or fallen into the river, but after learning about his wilderness survival skills, they instead proposed given his eerie final blog post that he had actively chosen to go off the grid. While police say that all efforts were made to locate the missing 35-year-old, a source told Outside Online that they were unequipped and unmotivated, simply trying to appease Justin's family and the US Embassy. Law enforcement found Justin's motorbike still in the place where he'd left it before he traveled into the valley, his belongings untouched. He had never made it to his vehicle after speaking with the group of hikers on September 3rd. That much is clear. To this day, his case remains unsolved. Jeffrey John Zoltowski Born March 19th, 1970, Jeffrey John Zoltowski was 23 years old when he went missing from Hawaii. A graduate of Livona Stevenson High School and a student at Wayne State University in Michigan, Jeffrey had traveled to Hawaii to hike and explore and figure out what exactly he wanted to do with his life. A committed vegetarian who refused to wear anything leather, Jeffrey's loved ones described him as a compassionate and caring young man who did volunteer work regularly. He was also close to both of his divorced parents. Further proof of Jeffrey's kind nature was shown when, during his first few days on the island, Jeffrey met a man who'd become separated from his friends while hiking, and offered to walk him out of the trail if need be, staying with him until a rescue helicopter arrived. Jeffrey was wearing white shorts and a purple tie-dye t-shirt when he was last seen on March 31st, 1993. Hiking in the Wailua Valley after making his way through the trail, he eventually flagged down a helicopter from the Department of Land and Natural Resources, claiming his feet were blistered and bleeding, and that he was too tired to make the 14-mile hike back to civilization, asking for a ride back instead. The pilot of the helicopter deemed the matter to be non-life-threatening, and so refused to carry Jeffrey as a passenger. He did mention, however, that the 23-year-old could charter a plane, but it would cost him $650, money that Jeffrey simply didn't have. The pilots then offered to take the student's 60-pound backpack to the DLNR service yard on the island, to which Jeffrey agreed. When Jeffrey first went missing, nobody noticed. He'd told family members that he was going camping for two weeks, so when they didn't hear from him, 
they weren't alarmed. When two weeks turned into three and four weeks, they assumed he'd maybe met someone and was swept up in a new romance. Meanwhile, Jeffrey's backpack at the DLNR service yard continued to sit unclaimed for over a month. It took 41 days before somebody finally realized that it hadn't been collected and a missing persons report was filed for Jeffrey. The search for the 23 year old is largely undocumented online. The only thing that's clear is that search parties found no trace of the student along the trail or off the beaten path. Jeffrey's father, Ron, flew to Hawaii in May of 1993, spending 35 days and $39,000 of his own money searching for his missing son. He also appeared on Oprah and other network television shows, although no new leads came from these appeals to the public. There is one known possible sighting, near a homeless shelter and Kmart in Honolulu. This sighting took place on July 28th, 2001, eight years after Jeffrey was last seen. A woman reported that the man called himself Sam or Samuel and panhandled for money from cars that were stopped in the traffic. He had heavy facial scarring, a limp and slurred speech, a possible indication that he'd suffered a severe head injury in the past. This sighting has not been confirmed to be Jeffrey, and investigators have never been able to locate this homeless man. No one at the shelter recognized Jeffrey's photograph. A separate witness said in regards to law enforcement following the lead that the unidentified man just disappeared afterwards. If it was Jeffrey, it's unknown how he managed to get to a different island. One article from 1995 reported that a niece of a friend of Ron's told her family that she'd been on Kauai Island and seen, quote, a kid who was missing from Molokai. This niece was unaware that her family knew the Zoltowskis and she has not been located for an interview. In 2006, Ron told of how much time he spent at home waiting for a phone call or email that would have all the answers. A psychic once told him that Jeffrey is still alive and he continued to hold on to that last glimmer of hope. Meanwhile, Joseph Self, a former Honolulu police officer who was assigned to the case, believes that the young man perished somewhere in the wilderness. There are a few theories tossed about online when it comes to Jeffrey's case. Some believe he fell victim to the elements, whilst others believe he's alive but suffering from amnesia. But one thing everyone agrees on is the absurdity that he was not reported missing for 41 days, despite his backpack being in the DLNR service yard unclaimed for that length of time, even more so since Jeffrey had complained to one of the pilots. Why didn't the pilot notice he hadn't picked it up? Many are also confused as to why the pilot took Jeffrey's backpack in the first place, given that it contained a first aid kit among other essential hiking supplies. Jeffrey's mother, Karen, passed away in November of 2005 during heart surgery, having never found an answer to what happened to her son. To this day, Ron remains ever hopeful that any information will be found in the case of Jeffrey John Zoltowski. Amy Joy Rowe Bechtel. Amy Joy Rowe Bechtel was born in Santa Barbara, California in August of 1972 to Duane and Joanne Rowe. She was the youngest of four siblings and started running when she was in the sixth grade. Shortly before her disappearance, Amy graduated from the University of Wyoming, where she studied exercise physiology, was a competitive long distance runner, and met Steve Bechtel. The couple married in 1996, after dating for four years and moved to Lander, a small town in Wyoming, upon graduating. By all accounts, 24-year-old Amy was a well-liked woman with an interest in photography and big ambitions to try out for the 2000 Summer Olympics. Loved ones described her as determined, thoughtful, and trusting. On the morning of July 24th, 1997, Amy told her husband Steve that she planned to run errands in town after hosting a child's weightlifting class at the Wind River Fitness Center, a class which lasted just one hour and a half. After teaching, Amy stopped in at Camera Connection, a photo store near her home, around 2.30 p.m. 
From here, the 24-year-old dropped in at Gallery 331, where she spoke to the proprietor, Greg Wagner. Upon being interviewed, Wagner noted that Amy seemed to be in a hurry, repeatedly glancing at her watch during their conversation. Other accounts of Amy that day describe her as being upbeat. Her visit to Gallery 331 is the last confirmed sighting of Amy. Afterwards, authorities believe Amy drove to Shoshone National Forest to practice the course for an upcoming 10K that she was enrolled to compete in. An eyewitness driving on Loop Road through the forest that afternoon claimed to have seen a woman matching Amy's description running along the road wearing black shorts and a yellow t-shirt, like those Greg Wagner had seen her wearing earlier that day. Meanwhile, it was 4.30 in the afternoon by the time Steve Bechtel returned home. He had spent the day with a friend, and as soon as he stepped through the door of his house, he noticed his wife wasn't there. He waited a few hours for her to return, assuming she had been held up somewhere. Amy did not come home. At 10.30pm, Steve called the police to report his wife missing. A few hours later, at 1am on the morning of the 25th, Amy's car was discovered parked on a turnout at Burnt Gulch in Lander. The car was unlocked, her keys were under her to-do list, and her sunglasses also remained, but her wallet was gone. This was odd, those who knew the 24-year-old reported, as she never took it out running with her. By 3am, an extensive search was underway with law enforcement. It's noted that Amy's friends and family had begun searching before authorities arrived, meaning that it is possible, no matter how well-intentioned, that they contaminated the crime scene. A small footprint similar to Amy's was found alongside Loop Road, but it was destroyed before it could be positively matched. Her car was also never fully investigated. A friend ended up driving it home, meaning it likely lost crucial evidence, if there was any there at all. One thing to note about this case is the extremely shoddy police work. This is thought to be because the original investigator, David King, used the case for his own personal career gains. In 1998, King was elected as sheriff, but he resigned two years later due to allegations of impropriety, and was later convicted for stealing cocaine from law enforcement's evidence storage locker. Yellow ribbons began appearing everywhere. The idea of the brightly coloured fabric being all across the town was to raise awareness for Amy's case, and asking her, if she was out there, to come home. Psychics stepped forward, some offering clues whilst others asked for money. A bottle was found in a river near Main Street in Lander, and inside was a handwritten note, reading, Help! I'm being held captive in Sinks Canyon. Amy. The handwriting was confirmed to not be a match to the missing 24-year-olds. Family and friends offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to Amy's whereabouts. They also mailed out 80,000 flyers to satellite volunteers and created a website dedicated to the search. It was clear to them that she did not disappear of her own volition. Authorities worked with Steve and their loved ones, hoping to find Amy alive and well. Fast forward to July 27th, and law enforcement found that they were receiving 1,000 calls a day with potential tips. But, in the end, none of them ever panned out. Lakes and mines around the area were searched, and horses, cavadier dogs, and the National Guard were utilized, all to no avail, and the leads quickly began to dry up. In the initial days of Amy's disappearance, it was widely believed that she had simply fallen victim to the elements, or even a bear or a mountain lion. It seemed an unspoken belief by all involved that she would be found alive. Maybe she simply fell and hurt her leg or ankle. However, authorities slowly began to suspect otherwise. There was no sign of Amy, no blood to indicate she may have been attacked, no clothing scraps. So, police turned their attention to Steve Bechtel. The hunch that law enforcement had began sprouting when they uncovered a series of journals in which Steve described violence towards women, especially his wife. These journals have never been made public, but reportedly contained themes of having power and control. During an interrogation in August of 1997, authorities falsely claimed that they had evidence to prove that he was guilty and had harmed his wife. 
to which Steve responded by terminating the interview. Later, when interviewed about the journals, Steve said they contained made-up song lyrics for his band and that they were unrelated to Amy in any way. He also provided an alibi for the time his wife went missing. He was rock climbing with friends, who backed up this story. A year later, in 1998, police clarified that Steve was not a central suspect in the case, but that they had wanted to clear him of suspicion in order to follow other leads. They added that they were unable to do so due to a lack of cooperation from Steve, who refused to speak to police after they lied to him about their evidence. He also denied the invitation to take a polygraph test. Steve said he didn't want to due to their unreliability. He also claimed that he had worked well with authorities until they had aggressively approached him and falsely claimed they had evidence against him. It's noted that Amy's brother and father were particularly angry that Steve continuously refused to take a polygraph test, and her brother claimed that just weeks before she went missing, he saw a suspicious bruise on his sister's arm. Amy allegedly said that sometimes, quote, Steve got a little rough, but she was unfazed by this and it did not appear to trouble her. There are conflicting statements about the couple's relationship, with some claiming it was idyllic, while others said that Steve could be extremely jealous and often belittled Amy, and that her demeanor changed around him. Steve and Amy's sisters appeared on the Geraldo Rivera show that same year, where he denied, again, being involved in the disappearance of his wife. At that time, Steve believed that his wife was being kept alive by someone infatuated with her, or that she possibly had amnesia. He described her as being a trusting person who generally thinks people have good intentions, perhaps implying that he felt this was her biggest flaw. Luminol testing was conducted in the home Amy and Steve shared, but turned up nothing. Rumors swirled that Steve had buried his wife under the driveway of their newly purchased home, but authorities found nothing when searching the area. In late August of 1997, the FBI, who'd become involved just five days after the disappearance, requested satellite photos from NASA of the 24th of July, when Amy went missing, but no further information could be provided from the photos. The same thing occurred in January of 1998, when satellite images taken by the Russian space station were also obtained by the FBI. Again, this search for answers proved fruitless. Although Amy's disappearance was profiled in several magazines, featured on Unsolved Mysteries, and overall received significant media attention at the time, it appears that this led to no new developments in the investigation. As leads fizzled out one by one, the case of Amy Bechtel began to grow cold. In June 2003, Almost six years after Amy was last seen, a Timex Iron Man digital watch was found by a doctor and turned into police. There is no confirmation that this watch is definitely Amy's, but it certainly does resemble one that she owned at the time she went missing. A few years later in 2007, in an interview with the Billing Gazette, Sheriff Sergeant Roger Rizza stated, quote, I believe it was a homicide and I believe what happened to her happened on the day she disappeared. In my mind, there is only one person I want to talk to. Only one person who has refused to talk to law enforcement. And that is her husband. Dale Wayne Eaton, a convicted murderer on Wyoming's death row, has also been cited as a suspect in the case of Amy Bechtel. Eaton is believed to be responsible for a series of slayings dubbed the Great Basin Murders, and is imprisoned for the rape and murder of 18-year-old Lisa Kimmel in 1988. According to his brother, he had been in the area where Amy went missing. However, Eaton himself has refused to discuss the case, and his niece claimed that she was with him in Colorado on June 24th, 1997. Recent developments in Amy's disappearance are few and far between. The case was featured on the TV show Disappeared in 2013, and was also the suspect of an article in Runner's World in 2016. Amy's former husband, Steve Bechtel, has since gone on to remarry, and now has two children, and her father has since passed away. As of 2020, the case remains unsolved.
Thomas Hottard and Audrey Moat. 46-year-old Thomas Hottard was a married man native to Louisiana in 1956, who was also maintaining a relationship with a 31-year-old woman named Audrey Moat. Audrey, a divorced single mother of three from Baton Rouge, had met her lover at a local chemical company where they both worked in 1952. Their blossoming romance, which ensued soon after, was a well-kept secret from those around them, including their colleagues. While Audrey included Thomas in her social life, he was always introduced as a friend. In 1955, Audrey went to live in St. Louis for five months to recover from a nervous breakdown. She returned home with a baby girl whose parents didn't want her, but it was uncovered that Thomas had sponsored the adoption and allowed Audrey to use his surname on the paperwork, leading many online sleuths to speculate that he was the child's father. Audrey's other two children were fathered by her ex-husband. The couple regularly met up on Saturdays, where they both would tell the same lie to their families, which was that they simply had to go into work. This was the case on Saturday the 24th of November, 1956. It should have been like any other meetup, as the pair met around 7.30 a.m. and drove to a secluded lover's lane. A father and son spotted Audrey and Thomas around 9 a.m. And unfortunately, they were also the ones to discover the grisly murder scene the following morning. Thomas Hottard had been shot once in the head with a 16 gauge shotgun point blank through a side window. Initially, authorities speculated that Audrey was the murderer and had killed her boyfriend in a fit of rage that had followed from a lover's spat. However, this opinion changed when 50 feet away, bare footprints were spotted on the ground, followed by boot prints, as if Audrey was being chased. Her clothing was found in the car, and personal items were discovered on the ground beside the vehicle. The keys were still in the ignition, but another set of car keys were found where the footprints were located. The footprints, suspected as being Audrey's, ended at a single motorbike track on a road leading to the highway. Audrey's purse was never recovered, and later on, her car was found at the restaurant where the couple had met. Police realized that the car keys found on the ground at the crime scene belonged to Audrey's car. Strangely, it was discovered that just weeks before the murder, Audrey told her mother that she should take the kids and leave the area, but she did not explain why. Two weeks following the crime, on December 6th, Audrey's former mother-in-law got a phone call. The voice on the end of the line said they were in trouble and needed help. Also around this time, a waitress told police that she'd seen a disheveled woman resembling Audrey at a restaurant. This was the last reported sighting of the 31-year-old. An early suspect in the murder of Thomas Hottard was a 41-year-old man by the name of Edmund Dewey. He shot and wounded a woman during a robbery attempt in New Orleans and was linked to the case by a purse that was found in his car, which resembled the description of Audrey's one. After being given a police administered quote unquote truth serum, Dewey confessed to killing the pair and burying Audrey's body in a dump. However, it was not found there when police searched. It is unknown if Dewey is still considered a suspect, but it seems unlikely since very little seemed to tie him to the case and confessions under the influence of police-administered chemicals and drugs are often inaccurate and untrue. Inquiries into the murder of Thomas and the disappearance of Audrey quickly died out. The case came to a standstill entirely until 1980, when a dying man named Ernest Acosta indicated to his family that his common-law wife, Caroline Schlesser, who died in 1979, killed both Audrey and Thomas. Acosta claimed that he then helped to dispose of Audrey's body. However, Acosta's daughter, Marville, suspects that her father was involved, not Schlesser. And there are some unusual discrepancies in his confession. Acosta and Schlesser lived on the edge of a swamp, less than a mile from the crime scene, and both had bad reputations. Schlesser was known to sleep with a shotgun, while Acosta shot at anyone who came too close to the property. Acosta's daughter claimed Henry and Audrey came to the house at least twice and met with Schlesser. Acosta claimed that they knew something about her, but it is unknown what. Supposedly, Audrey was related to Schlesser, but again, 
it's unknown how. According to Acosta, on November 24th, 1956, he was visiting his kids but received a phone call from Schlesser that caused him to rush home immediately. He claimed that the murders took place in their home and that he and a neighbor moved Thomas's body back into the car. However, it seems questionable that a neighbor would be happy to be involved in the cover-up of a murder. Allegedly, Audrey's body was tied to a Civil War cannon and was dumped in the nearby swamp. Acosta's daughter, Marvel, has told of her suspicions about the confession, especially since the evidence showed that Thomas was murdered in his car. Marvel and a recent case investigator suspect that Acosta was the murderer and that after watching the pair together in the car, he decided to attack them and sexually assault Audrey. The only other logical suspects in the gruesome case would be Thomas's wife, who reportedly knew and openly disliked Audrey. Apparently, during a work strike, Thomas had allowed Audrey to stay with his family in his home, and she would constantly attempt to be around Thomas and cause dissension between the married couple. However, Thomas's wife claimed that she was unaware of the affair and was therefore never truly considered a suspect. Audrey's daughter, Decky, was desperate to find her mother's remains and searched for answers up until she passed away in January of 2019 from an aggressive cancer. She gave her DNA to police before her death in the hopes that one day, her mother's remains would be identified. To this very day, Audrey's remains have never been recovered. In February of 2011, human remains were found that were suspected to be Audrey's, but this lead does not seem to have panned out, so it's likely they were not the missing mother of three's bones after all. Now, almost 70 years since her disappearance, it seems unlikely that Audrey's body will ever be found. Carol Cole Previously known as the Boza Doe, Carol Cole spent most of her death being an unidentified Jane Doe. Oddly, Carol had been ruled out as being the identity of the Jane Doe, but it is unknown why. Carol was just 17 years old when her body was found in 1981 in the Boza Parish, Louisiana. She had been concealed in a heavily wooded area. She was found wearing jeans, a white long-sleeved top with pink, yellow, and blue stripes, a beige hooded sweater, white socks with blue and yellow streaks, white boxer briefs and bra, and size seven shoes. One of the most identifying accessories she wore was a leather belt with the buckle reading, Buffalo Nickel. Carol's cause of death was established as stabbing, and her body had been punctured nine times. The murder weapon was found in the soil near her remains. She was killed around four to seven weeks before her body was discovered, and she was in an unrecognizable state of decomposition, although authorities did manage to create a description of what the victim may have looked like. Carol, known as the Boza Doe at the time, was described as being white with possible Native American ancestry, five foot five to five foot six, and 125 to 160 pounds with blonde, straight, shoulder length hair. It was also discovered that her braces had been removed, but not professionally. Although Carol's sister, Linda Jeannie Phelps, did not give up looking for her, it was a 911 operator who made the connection between Carol Cole and the Boza Doe. On February 6th, 2015, the 911 operator who'd seen Boza Doe's image as well as Carol's on a Facebook page reported the likeness to the police. The match was solidified via DNA and Carol was reburied in Maple Grove Cemetery in Comstock, Michigan on June 18th, 2015. Carol Cole was native to Michigan and had been missing from San Antonio, Texas since 1980. She and her sister Jeannie had lived with their grandmother in Michigan after their parents had divorced, but in 1979, Carol decided to accompany her mother to Texas and kept in contact with her sister via telephone and handwritten letters. It seemed that Carol had a history of running away as when her mother placed her in a girl's home run by the Palmer Drug Abuse Program in May of 1980, she had left of her own volition by October that same year. The phone calls and letters that her family had been receiving stopped in December of 1980. Her grandmother traced a place she had stayed at to Shreveport, Louisiana. 
Carroll had reportedly resided here for a short time after leaving the PDAP. The residents of the home told Carol's grandmother that she'd left to attend a party and never returned. It's possible that after this time, Carol had spent a period of her life at a religious institution named the New Bethany School for Girls in Arcadia, Louisiana. An image taken around the time of her disappearance showed a group of girls from the school sitting on pews, and Jeannie thought that one of them resembled Carol. Investigators followed this lead, but it resulted in no new information other than that a woman claimed to have spent time with a girl like Carol, but had forgotten her name. Some believe the shoes and style of clothing that she was found in reflected the dress code set in place by the New Bethany School for Girls. It's also noted that Carol had broken the braces from her teeth before she disappeared. This lined up well with the Boza Doze orthodontics. Jeannie had also reported her sister missing, suspecting foul play once the communication between them abruptly halted. She and a childhood friend of Carol's had relentlessly searched for the missing girl for years, even listing her on Facebook and Craigslist to garner some awareness for the case. And, as we know, it was this that led the 911 dispatcher to come across the striking resemblance between the Boza Doe and Carol. The 17-year-old's grandmother searched for her granddaughter tirelessly too, but passed away before this connection was made. A man named Henry Lee Lucas, a serial killer, confessed to the murder of Carol Cole and that of other unidentified victims. However, his confession is not deemed as credible by authorities. He was in Florida at the time of Carol's demise. The strongest suspect in the case of Carol Cole is a man named John Chesson, whose children discovered the body in 1981. His daughter, Frances Oquan, was the one to point the finger. According to Francis, Chesson had taken the children hunting for the first time that day to establish his innocence by finding the victim's body and reporting it. Reportedly, Chesson had instructed the children to walk in a certain direction, watching them like he was waiting for something. Francis described her father as abusive and claimed that a young hitchhiker he'd brought home was Carol. Chesson had been convicted for the murder of his estranged wife's former mother-in-law in 1997 and died in prison in 2016. Francis's brother committed suicide in 2008. Investigators working on the case of Carol Cole interviewed the widow of Francis's brother as well as Chesson, who remained a person of interest up until his death. The lead investigator on the case asked Francis to show her where her father picked up the girl who was possibly Carol Cole and was taken to one of the locations where Carol had last made a call to Michigan from. Francis did not know this prior to showing the investigator the location. The only other theory in the case was brought up by Jeannie, who claimed that Carol had mentioned a boyfriend who mistreated her in one of her letters. However, this lead does not seem to have been followed up or perhaps led nowhere. The New Bethany School for Girls was closed down in 2001 after being the site of multiple sexual abuse allegations. The founder died in February 2015, aged 82. The identity of the murderer of Carol Cole remains unknown, and her sister still seeks justice. The Jeff Davis Eight. The Jeff Davis Eight, also called the Jennings Eight, refers to the unsolved murder cases of women killed in Jefferson Davis Parish, Louisiana. Between 2005 to 2009, eight women involved in drugs or prostitution wound up dead, their bodies dumped in swamps and canals surrounding Jennings. Most of the bodies were so badly decomposed that their cause of death was hard to determine, although it was found that two of the eight women had their throats slit, while the remaining six are thought to have been asphyxiated. There have been multiple suspects in the case over the years, and while at first a serial killer was suspected to be the likely culprit, it seems more apparent now to the general public and the journalists who've investigated these cases that several different killers are more likely, although law enforcement has not entirely ruled out the serial killer angle. The case of the Jeff Davis Eight is infamous for the lack of professionalism conducted in the investigation. Missteps and blunders by the sheriff's office has led to lost and missing evidence and several failed charges on the case. 
Loretta Lewis was the first victim of the Jennings Eight. She was found in a river by a fisherman on May 20th, 2005, and was only 28 years old. After this, a steady stream of women started turning up murdered in the area. Ernstine Marie Daniels Patterson, 30, was the next victim, followed by Kristen Gary Lopez, Whitney Dubois, Laconia Muggy Brown, Crystal Zeno, and Brittany Gary, who was just 17. The eighth and final victims in the slayings was 26-year-old Nicole Gilroy, found just off of Interstate 10 in 2009. One of the most interesting puzzle pieces in the Jennings 8 case is that most of the victims knew each other in some way. Kristen and Brittany were cousins, whilst Brittany had also lived with Crystal as roommates shortly before her murder. What they all had in common was poverty and a history of drugs and sex work, and hidden from the public for a long time was that the girls all worked as informants for the police, providing information on the local drug trade. They also often gave authorities details on the other Jeff Davies eight victims before they wound up dead themselves. In December of 2008, a task force of 14 federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies was created, and they initially began searching for a serial killer. Although, as was mentioned earlier, this theory did somewhat eventually take a back seat. An $8,000 reward was created for any information that would lead to the cases being solved. One startling aspect of the case is that the police's own witnesses named local law enforcement members as suspects, and even the families of victims believe local police had a hand in the deaths of their daughters and sisters. Ethan Brown, an investigative journalist, made a deep dive into this complex and unsettling case. With the exception of Ernstine Patterson, every one of the women was linked with a 63-year-old oil rig worker turned strip club owner named Frankie Richard, who admitted to using drugs with and sleeping with most of the women. Richard was actually charged with the murder of Kristen Gary Lopez, but the charges were dropped due to conflicting witness statements and the mishandling of a key piece of physical evidence. It is suspected that street hustlers with connections to Richards were involved in the deaths of some of the women. Later, two other men named Byron Chad Jones and Lawrence Nixon, who was the cousin of Laconia Brown, were charged briefly with the murder of Ernstine Patterson but the sheriff's office did not test the alleged crime scene until 15 months after the murder, and it, quote, failed to demonstrate the presence of blood. And so the case collapsed as a consequence. Laconia had been interrogated about the murder of Ernstein, and one witness claims that Laconia had actually seen the body of Loretta, the first murder victim, before the fisherman found it and called it in. Then in 2006, Lopez was interviewed about Loretta's murder. Lopez's mother, who spoke to Ethan Brown in the detailed article he wrote about the Jeff Davis Eight, said, quote, "'She knew what was going on. They were scared, them girls. I think she knew about it and was too scared to say.'" It seems apparent that those questioned in high-profile homicides then turning up dead themselves should have raised red flags to the task force handling the Jennings Eight cases. So why wasn't this investigated further? Between the claims that local law enforcement members were involved, the family's belief that this was the case, and the known corrupt and flexible police force in the area, it seems that there's little doubt that authorities were involved in these killings. Since the 1990s to 2014, there are 20 unsolved homicides in the Jeff Davis Parish area. This is an unsettlingly low clearance rate inside of a high murder area. The Jennings Police Department and Jeff Davis Parish Sheriff's Office tout, quote, patterns and practices of unconstitutional conduct and seem to be unable to police themselves, often engaging in criminal acts that victimize rather than protect the citizens in their charge. 
At the end of 2008, a prostitute in the area warned the investigative task force that Nicole Gilroy might be the next victim. Nicole had a long rap sheet, with the majority of her charges having been dropped as the DA was unwilling to pursue them. Many snitches for police have their charges dropped like this in exchange for off-the-record cooperation. So it seems likely that although the sheriff refused to comment on whether the girls worked as informants for the police, they did indeed do this. Nicole's mother called her paranoid, saying, quote, it got to the point where she did not want to go anywhere by herself. And, quote, she used to tell us all the time that it was police killing the girls. Nicole told her mother she wouldn't be around for her 27th birthday and placed her four kids in the care of relatives. Task force witnesses say of Nicole in her final days, quote, she was scared of someone and, quote, she knew who killed the girls. Coincidentally, Ernstine's father was one of the last people to see Nicole alive. It is not an isolated incident in this case that relatives have claimed the women told them that law enforcement was to blame for the murders. In fact, it seems almost common knowledge among those who were close to the Jennings Eight. In 2007, a sergeant on the police force got word that two women in prison at the city jail wanted to shed some light on the unsolved homicides, which were carried out by, quote, high-ranking police officers. He taped the women as they told him highly specific details about the murders of Whitney and Kristen, and allegedly, police covered up Frankie Richards' role in at least one of their deaths. The murders of the Jeff Davis Eights remain unsolved to this day. The complex, intertwined cases carry many shocking and disturbing coincidences. Far too many for one to think that they are just coincidences. There is in fact too much information for us to be able to go through every detail, but one thing remains clear. There is something deeply disturbing going on in the Jeff Davis Parish Sheriff's Office. But at least for the moment, the murders of the Jeff Davis Eight will remain unsolved. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. If you're still hungry for more real life cold cases, please check out the Cold Case Detectives podcast. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.